Hey everyone and welcome to another video and today we're going to be covering my VEX guide. I know it's been a while, I've been busy coaching in the Midland Academy. Um, so from the start of the season, I've been playing a lot of VEX, both in the preseason and the start of the new season. I've been loving her, um, I've clicked really well with her. She's currently in my pool and going to stay in my pool probably for the majority of the season. I'm currently sitting at a 62% win rate with her on my Grandmaster account, 29 games. Not a large amount, but you know, heading in the right direction and I'm excited to share my findings. Let's get into it. Very fun champion. Um, this is what we're going to be covering today. A lot of stuff. As per usual, I'd recommend you go through it sequentially. If not, you're bored. Um, you want to get a specific thing from it. Skip to whatever you want to. Now, why Vex? There are many reasons that you might want to have Vex in your pool. Number one, great for people learning the fundamentals. If you're in gold and you want a very stock standard mage or battle-esque mage, Great for learning the fundamentals, ease of execution, simple reference points. Also, number two, great as a counter to dash heavy dive oriented champions like Jarv and Zach. You know, if you use your fear quite well, playing these champs into you, as same as Rek'Sai, can be very annoying for them. So great as a counter. Great as a secondary dive champion to complement other dive oriented champs on your team. So if, a lot of the time, if I'm in draft and I'm later in the pick and I see uh, a Kha'Zix on my team, or a Zed jungle, or a Javan jungle, or even like a Camille top or something like that. I love playing Vex because I know I can act as a follow-up dive, our threat is going to be immense, and the mid game is going to be quite straightforward. And for me, most importantly, great to counter champions like LeBlanc and Yasuo. For me, I didn't really have a reliable counter to LeBlanc in my pool. I know a lot of high elo players are currently investing in Vex for this reason, because LeBlanc is so popular in high elo games. Um, so this is, for me, the biggest reason. It's a great uh, great answer into LeBlanc. So um, see what works for you, what reason. Um, these are the main ones, though. Moving on, how do I interpret Vex's identity and you know what is she as a champion? Look, very simplistically, I think there are two ways to interpret Vex's identity. On the left-hand side, the secondary carry burst-oriented, more assassin-style, characterized with Ludens, you know, very burst-oriented, follow-up dive, cleanup crew-esque. Then on the right hand side, we have Everfrost Builders, um, you know, more of a facilitator identity, peeling, creating space, neutralizing certain carries on the enemy team. Now, look, I think that the best Vex player should theoretically be able to play both styles. They should be able to play the facilitator style and neutralize style with Everfrost when the time calls for it, when you're versing very like kiteable melee champions, things where you want to peel back or you've got a very fed carry, things like that. Conversely, I think they should be able to play the more assassin-esque style, which is for me personally my favorite um, on the left-hand side. Now for me, I, 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm always going this style. Now that's incorrect. Objectively on paper, that is incorrect, but I like playing this style and I find ways to make it work. And you'll see this in my gameplay later on when we get into the reviews. Um, but I know a lot of high elo Vex players, or not, not a lot, a few that default to Everfrost. They like that style. They like to have more, more uh, utility. And we'll get into this later, but both are completely viable. You need to find what style of Vex you like and what clicks with you at your rank, your interpretation of the champion on your server. Now for runes, very simple. You want to be going to electrocute every time, taste the blood, eyeball, or ghost power, either work. Now this last row is very preferential. I know some Vex players like to go Relentless, Ingenious, um, I personally default to Ultimate Hunter every single time because I think Vex is incredibly ultimate reliant. Um, Ingenious is quite good if you're going the Everfrost setup because a lot of the time you're getting value from Everf uh, Ingenious for the Everfrost and the Zonyas. Um, so I think Ingenious definitely has a place. Relentless obviously has a place because you're quite roam oriented, especially in the mid game. So um, all work, I personally like Ultimate Hunter. Now, secondary inspiration is my favorite. I would say most of the time, 85, 90% of the time, I'm going uh, Biscuit's Time Warp. But as of recently, I've, I've kind of converted to DMAT. And we'll, we'll, we'll touch on this later in the VODs, but I feel as though DMAT is incredibly underrated, especially in those Mage v Mage matchups where you really are struggling to find a roam window and you're constantly getting poked. DMAT, like DMATing a, a cannon and then shoving and moving, can be game changing. That's something that um, I would urge you, or at least every Vex player, to experiment with. But most of the time, you're not going to go wrong with you know time warp tonic biscuits. You're starting with C pot, nice, fast, and aggressive. I know some Vex players like Futures Market. They like to streamline their first mythic. Others like Stopwatch because your building's on yours anyway. Makes a lot of sense. And then Cosmic Drive, sorry, Cosmic Insight, for obvious reasons because um, Vex is very good with Flash and Ignite. Now. 
I'm not a fan of this middle page here, the sorcery. It does have a place, it is completely fine. I personally played quite fast, a fast style of Vex. If you are slower, maybe even in competitive play, you could probably get away with this. But again, if you interpret Vex or you like to play Vex a slower style, this probably scales a little bit, a bit better, right? Because Transcendence is quite nice in mid game. Um, but I'd never go this. And then, you know, if you're more, say if you're uncomfortable versing burst oriented assassins like a Fizz or a Kiana or something like that, yeah, sure, you can go kind of go bone plating overgrowth. But I think Vex has the tools inbuilt to like deal with these champions anyway. Like if you're very comfortable with your wave management and your fear usage, you shouldn't need to rely on secondary resolve to get away with dealing with these matchups. Like I'd rather you just take exhaust even rather than going secondary resolve because I think this is so important. So ultimately try it out, see what works for you in those burst oriented matchups. Now for build, keeping it simple as possible. Starting on the left hand side here, C pop versus Dorans. If you like to play a faster oriented style lane, C pop makes the most sense. If you want to slow it down, play a little bit more conservative. Doran, Doran's ring also works. Now most of the time, I find myself going back for an early Dark Seal of some form. I think Dark Seal works really well with Vex because you're so snow, snowball oriented, and you can basically guarantee a kill at level six. Very similar to say like a. Cassio when you're going that Ignite setup, or when you're going TF and you're getting an early kill with six. Um, same premise. Sorks nearly every single time. I personally find the burst synergizes incredibly well with Ludens. Now, yes, there are going to be the odd chance where you need a, a Mercs, or I know, I know some Vexes do like Ionian Boots, for, but for me, I interpret Vex as a very burst oriented, the way I like to play Vex is very burst oriented, assassin-esque, hence why I'm going Ludens 99% of the time, even though again, I'm going to make that very clear, on paper that is not correct, but that's the way I like to play Vex. Um, and I've got a note here, Everforce is objectively better into low range melee compositions that you can kite out. Um, so again, keep an open mind. Um, and I've got another note here. Vex really spikes hard at Sorks and Lost Chapter, or even just Sorks plus like double Am Tomb. This item plus a little bit of AP with six and Ignite, you are dangerous. You are incredibly dangerous. Um, but both these are viable. Now, what I find myself mostly doing at this point, say I have a Mythic, what I'll usually do is I'll buy a stopwatch and then if I don't use the stopwatch, I will build... Um, nearly see large rod and then I'll finish shadow flame if I feel as though it's a very tough game And I really have to get in there and it's very burst oriented champions and I'm using I need um, My stopwatch and I need Zonia's a lot then I'll just go, you know, boom Ludens into into Zonia's but most of the time I'm sitting on the stopwatch Assessing the way the game is playing out and if it's quite far if I'm snowballing I don't need it etc or, or you know, the game is very easy and I just want to run over the opponent. I'm just going to go straight stopwatch into Shadow Flame. I would say that's the most common build path for me. And then rounding it off with, with usually going Ludens, stopwatch, Shadow Flame, Zonyas, and then into like Death Cap or, or Void. Now, I know some Vexes like, you know, Horizons Focus. I hate it. It just doesn't feel good. It's a feel thing. I don't like it. I don't like the build path. It's just ugly. It's just an ugly item. I feel as though it doesn't do... It doesn't have a clear identity comparatively to these other items. I would rather the durability and everything else Shadow Flame gives in the pen. And then Crown. I don't think it really makes sense for Vex's identity because you're either playing Peel and being more facilitator style or you're being like a Burst Oriented Assassin-esque Battle Mage. Um, in which case, Crown doesn't do that. And the other thing as well is that Crown, I mean, it doesn't make sense with your identity because you already have plenty of self-peel with your fear and your W, so, and Zonia's, it's just, it's just overkill, you have no threat, you're, you're a useless champion when you build that item, most of the time. Magi's very important, um, if you're snowballing, a great item, and then Sweepers later on, once you're starting to snowball the world, because you're going to be shoving and moving. Pretty straightforward, don't overcomplicate it. You know, unless, you know, you're really at the top, D2+, plus. I wouldn't really be fussing over the, these item builds too much. Summoners, for me, 95% of the time I'm going to be going Ignite. It makes sense with the way I interpret Vex as a burst oriented assassin, synergizes very well with the Sorks and the Ludens. Um, and I think just overall it increases Vex's kill threat, th kill threat significantly at level 6 and changes the way 2v2s play out. Especially now since TP has been nerfed, I don't think it's as valuable. Um, so unless you're in a very slow game or you're playing competitive, I just don't think... 
TP really is is that strong. Um, situationally, exhaust into some dive oriented comps or assassins, and then cleanse situationally into say like a like a TF or a Lissandra. So I might get hate for this, but that's just my interpretation of Vex. At least what's given me success in solo queue. Now Vex's impact is actually tied to the champions that are in the game. So Vex, as I said before, mainly fits into either the category of engage slash follow up engage or neutralizer. So, when I'm in the draft, I'm in the loading screen, I'm looking for these sorts of things. This is the way I'm thinking. If I'm with these sorts of champions, I'm thinking, great, I can act as engage slash follow up engage with these champions and have a really beautiful multi-threat composition. If I'm playing with these champions, I'm thinking, holy moly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really struggle to figure out my identity here and I might even have to default to more of like a neutralizer because these champions aren't dive oriented. There is no multi-threat. There is no follow-up engage. And even engaging for these champions is awkward. So, uh, yeah, I really avoid trying to play Vex with these sorts of junglers. Um, when I'm versing these sorts of champions, again, I'm now defaulting to more neutralize. I can actually peel a little bit more, sit on my AD carry, utilize my fear and fires, pressing W when they dive in, basically nullifying a lot of these champions and being more of a facilitator. And then when I'm versing these champions... They can be quite nasty because, you know, long range, non-committal, a little mobility, anti-dive um, can be a pain in the ass. But if I am paired with these champions and I have multi-thread on my comp, it doesn't really matter anyway. And we're going to cover a game later on where I'm versing a Lux. I think I'm versing like a, like a lot of anti-dive, but we have so much engage, it doesn't even matter. Very important to really consider the champions that you're, pl you're playing with. Just like you would if you're playing TF. It really alters the way your champ's identity is formed in that game. Now for early lane wave management, okay? First thing, very important to understand. I don't believe Vex should be played to necessarily win lane. I think your laning is inherently weak. We'll get into in a second what I think the, the lane phase should really look like, like from a strategic standpoint, but I don't ever come into a lane thinking, yes, I'm gonna dominate my opponent. Like very different to the mindset I would have if I'm playing Orianna or Victor or Syndra where I wanna dominate my opponent. I don't have that mentality. Sure, if I can take opportunistic trades, I will, but I'm not coming in to dominate my opponent. So this is like a rough guideline, the way I interpret these matchups. If I'm versing low range, melees or semi-melees, uh, sorry, low range mages and semi-melees, I'll try to keep the wave neutral or slightly on my side. If I'm versing high range mages, um, sorry, high range mages and low cooldown mages, this, this, there's multiple options here. Um, you can use offense as defense. I'll actually be covering a VOD later on where I'm versing a Zoe and I use this strategy successfully. Um, we're also going to be watching another VOD later on of RJS playing Vex into Victor where he does this keep neutral slash match up to the best of your ability. So we can get a, a combination, look at both, what both look like. And theoretically, you can pull for ganks if you've got a very uh, gank oriented jungler, which I'd say this is less likely. These are the two most common ones. And then on the right hand side, into these pure melees, you can stack three and harass with auto attacks, or you can stack two and bounce. Vex can really do either because if you hold your fear, they can't really all in you anyway. Um, if they're very bad, you're in lower elo, they're probably going to shove into you from level one, in which you can just pull away from level one. So this is kind of the way I interpret it holistically. You know, this might not really help you. If you want to get more practical and pragmatic, you can skip to the VOD section so you can really get into the details there. So what we're going to do now is dive into some early lane tips with plenty of examples. So sit tight, guys. So now for some early lane tips. The first one, level one, you have two options. You can start E, posture up aggressively, get that E into uh, the, pass the, the passive proc with the auto attack, which is a nice little short trade like that. Very, very common. I generally do this into 85% of matchups, any mid to low range matchup. Um, you can also start Q. So I'm versing something like a Lux. Um, I'm versing a Zerath, any like very high range mage or artillery mage, I'll actually start Q and do this. I'll actually Q the wave level one, stand outside the wave, so they have to make a choice between me and the wave. And this way I guarantee level two first, I'm making them react and I'm pushing the pace of the lane, making them very uncomfortable. This is an incredibly viable strategy. There is actually a third strategy that you, that I will do very rarely. If I'm versing something like, like a Fizz, sometimes I even start uh, w level one, so then they can't actually cheese me with a with a with a Q start and just walk up. Because if you're versing a fizz and you walk up and try and E, they're just gonna E it. 
So you're not going to get much value, nor are you going to get value from Q because most of the time you're three stacking anyway. So you can actually start W level one in some of those very, very low range matchups. But I'll say that, you know, that's quite rare. Most of the time you're going Q, hard shoving, or just going E and maintaining your poise. Now, if you are going to start E on just using E in general, you really want to avoid these max range E's. The reason being, if you go for a max range E like this, most of the time they're going to be at the very back end of the E and which they're going to get pushed this way. Now for those of you who aren't familiar with how the fear direction actually works, think of it as like a clock. I view this as a clock and in the middle you have like the dot. If they're like on that, if they think of it like as an angle, so that's at three o'clock here, they're going to go this way. If they're at 12 o'clock or anywhere on this line, they're going to kind of go that way. It kind of depends which way they're walking in a way. So um. This way, obviously, based off where I land the E with the fear, he's gonna go the completely opposite direction. Now, I can't walk up and follow up with a passive auto because he's gonna Q auto me. So I basically waste my fear cooldown, my fear and my E cooldown. That's an absolute disaster. So you really wanna make sure you're avoiding those max range E's unless you're able to follow up with a Q. Somebody keep in mind, here's another example of one of those max range E's. I get no value, I can't walk up because otherwise she's gonna turn around and, and hit me and I'm gonna be taking minion aggro. So most of the time I'll be doing this. I'll walk up, I'll hold my E, I'll bait out their ability and overwhelm the enemy mental stack. So take a look at this. So I'm walking up, I'm like faking, I'm exerting pressure with my E, walking back and forward. And then boom, at some point he's gonna panic, he gets a little bit too close and then I can get the E into auto attack. You don't want to rush it. Now, if you can out tether and your clicks are very high quality, what you can actually do, walk back and forth, he oversteps forward, which allows you to step behind him or get the E behind him, which pushes you into him. Now it's even better at level three if you could do this because you push him into your W um, and you get the shield and you proc the extra damage. But that's a this is a classic example of what happens if you can out tether and take a beautiful little short trade like that because you're pushing them into you. Very nice. Wave clear properly, you know, a very simple one, but I have to put it in here. In here. Make sure that you're Eing first, not queuing first, because if you E first, you utilize your fear, get that off cooldown, and then you proc, you get the passive proc on all of them, and then you Q3 to proc the passive. So take a look at this, boom, boom. And look at that, my fear is nearly back up already because I EQ through all of them. Something simple, but it makes a big difference because now I'm, uh, if there's a skirmish in the river, my fear will be already ready to go. And if I had R, I could just go boom, R, W, and then I can actually fight. But if I went Q, then E, I'm not going to have my fear available and I can actually make a very big difference. Um, okay, so everything revolves around your fear. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time when you play Fex to get used to your fear. But here... Let's say theoretically, I am here, I actually do it. I use my Q on the wave in front of Lux's face. Now notice, nothing, I'm, I'm useless. Like I have no Q, my E does nothing because by itself, I mean, I can't proc it with anything. My W is super low range and my Q's on cooldown. So even if I say I were to use Q on the wave and now my, I mean, I have nothing. Even if I had my fear with my E, it's so low threat. So when you're playing for the, you know, playing to, to shove and use your offense as defense, you've got to be very careful. The analogy or the comparison I'll use here is very similar to playing TF and using like your goal card on a minion in front of the enemy. Your fear is everything. Without your fear, you have nothing. It's very difficult to take trades. The other reason that's the case, it, let's say even if I was to use my E on the wave and I had my Q available, it's highly unlikely that I'm ever going to be able to go for a max range Q and actually land it on the enemy because it's such an unreliable ability. Most of my damage is going to come from me landing the E or landing the fear and then following up with other abilities. So um, just be very careful. Your fear is a pivotal part of your trading patterns. Be careful if you're using a fear in the wave in front of their face. Now in certain matchups, reactive fear usage is quite important. Here in Anivia, I'm waiting for the R so that I can interrupt it with the, with the fear. Very important. Now, if I'm versing champions like LeBlanc, I'm versing Fizz, even Silas here, champions that can dive onto me, my fear is my only form of self-peel. So a lot of the time, um, I will only use my fear aggressively if the wave is in a good spot and I know they can't use their gap closer on me or they're too scared because of the gank threat that's getting imposed onto them. If the wave is in the middle or on their side, I'll be a little bit more conservative with my fear usage because I know that if either I miss my fear or they use their abilities reactively to my E and I miss it, I'm basically um, up shit creek, I'm screwed. So here, take a look, I go for a very 
a very poor E. I miss it, not timed with the last hit, just completely rushed, terrible E, and that leaves me completely exposed to getting potentially traded on by the Silas. Now, I've, because of the wave location, I was kind of close to my tower, I could kind of navigate away from it, but um, if the wave, I mean, two things, now my fear's gone, so I actually have to give pressure, and I'm probably gonna get zoned from this wave, but if this wave was further up here, I'd be in a lot of trouble. So something to keep in mind when you're versing dive-oriented assassins, or just people that can jump onto you. Um, same thing here, when fear's down, be be respectful. Silas is able to just jump onto me, take a really, really good trade, and I can do nothing. Sure, I propped a passive because he jumped, he dashed, whatever, but it's, you know, I can't match that, that, uh, I can't match that trade, no way. And if I, but whereas if I had fear here and he jumped on me straight away, I could Q, disengage right into Q, straight away, boom. Ideally, I have W and I press W straight away, you know, but you get the point. Now, um, you know, okay, how do I explain this? So there's going to be champions that you verse that have very low CC. So for example, Corky, this is the example I used before. I'm not afraid to use my EQ or to, like stay in combat essentially. Like I can fear them towards me. I can Q, I can auto attack. I can stay in combat. When I'm versing champions that have follow up damage or follow up CC, I got to be very careful. So if I'm versing say like a LeBlanc, for example, and I fear and I push them into me or I try to take a trade and I stay in combat trying to go for that extra auto attack, I will get punished. So when I'm versing LeBlanc or like some champion, like even like an Ari, I'm just gonna be going for an E into a Q, getting that short trade, not procking my Electro, because if I walk up for the auto attack, unless I'm inside the wave, the Ari's just gonna charm me on the back end and trade onto me. So you gotta be very careful about when you're taking the actual extended trade and getting that extra auto attack on the back end. It really depends on how much threat the enemy can um, impose onto you. Um, another little little small nitpick here, and you'll see in a second, this Anivia ends up missing the E anyway, so it doesn't even matter. But let's say here, I took a nice little trade, I, you know, whatever, EQ. If they're gonna trade onto me on the back end, a lot of the time, you could just use your W anyway. Even if you're not hitting anything around you, it still gives you the shield regardless. So I can mitigate some of the damage here. I mitigated some of the damage that Nivea did with the Q just by simply using my W reactively. Now, when you don't have fear, there's a last little tip here. When you don't have fear available, don't be afraid, if you have plenty of mana, don't be afraid just to fish for low value Qs or low percentage Qs. If you hit it, you hit it. If you don't, you don't. It's pretty cheap. It's pretty low cooldown. It's not the end of the world. So here, for example, I don't have fear. I'm just going to fish for like a low value or low percentage Q. If it hits, great. If it doesn't, no biggie. So hopefully these give you a little bit of, you know, a little bit of insight into the early lane here. Let's continue on. So one of the most important things when playing Vex is developing the shark mindset. Now you're like, what the hell is the shark mindset? Um, so this is the way I interpret Vex. So post six, this is when you really come online. You get this beautiful, long range engage ability. And I view myself in many ways as like a shark. Now let's just imagine, you know, a shark is roaming the waters, you know, an equivalent of say roaming in the river as a Vex. If the shark, you know, there's like that meme, I don't know if it's a meme or if it's real, but if there's like a drop of blood somewhere in the ocean, the shark can smell it and they're going to start swimming towards it and directing their attention towards where that blood is in the water because they can smell the blood. Same thing when it comes to Vex. If I sense or see that there's heavy trading in the side lanes or in the river or in the jungle, Boom, I'm going there. I'm, I'm going to walk over there, or in this case, swim over there, and I'm going to look to engage, come in from the side, boom, and take someone out while they're injured. This is what I call the shark mindset. Now, it's important to actually view yourself as like a healthy or I would say somewhat, you know, fit shark in the sense that if you're sitting in lane with low resources, let's just say you're sitting in lane, you started C-pot, but you've got no C-pots left. You're sitting in lane with 30% HP and only 10% mana. The shark mindset doesn't mean jack shit, does it? Because even if you sense something happening or you see something happening somewhere, you're not going to be able to go to the fight because you don't have the mana or the resource to actually attend. So that's why when I play Vex, I'm constantly resetting post six especially, making sure that I'm as healthy as possible because I want to make sure that if something happens somewhere, boom, I'm going in, I smell blood, I execute, okay? And we're going to take a second, you know, in a little bit, show two examples of what this shark mindset actually looks like in a game. But before we get to that, I want to quickly talk about Vex's timeline. Now, a lot of people like to have this overarching understanding of 
how a champion is meant to play out a game. And look, I don't usually like doing this because it is very general and it's a very case-by-case -case basis, but at a very simplistic, in a very simplistic way, this is how I interpret it. Levels one to six, minimizing slash opportunistic trades. I'm not really playing to solo kill my opponent, but if they give me the trading opportunity, I will take it. But largely I'm minimizing farming well, trying to get to my level six. Now level six to nine, either I'm gonna fish for a solo kill because they're disrespectful, I've got a good matchup, you know, they just, I'm just able to land a lot of poke damage, or maybe they've counted me, I can't interact, I'm getting left on an island, I don't feel like I can do anything in the 1v1, and I'm just going to simply play for shove and move. I'm going to clear the wave and then move, clear the wave and then move. That's usually level 6 to 9. Then levels 9 plus, I'm not interacting at all in the 1v1, and I'm only ever playing for shove, move, and hover. So this is a really solid, like, overarching framework with the way I interpret Vex anyway. Please don't get caught up in playing over and over and over for the lane. I know a lot of Vex players think, oh, okay, I'm ahead, I can kill them again, I can kill them again. No, that's not really what you should be doing with Vex. Vex, you really need secondary win conditions. You need other Fen members. If you're the only member where the threat is coming from, you're going to find it difficult to actually kill the Nexus. You'll get a lead, you'll get strong, but you actually find it hard to win the game. So let's dive into two examples of what this shark mindset actually looks like. So in this game, I'm 10 minutes 30 in. Um, I'm doing okay, not amazing. I'm one, two, but I, I've got my Lost Chapter and my Sork, so I know I have a lot of damage. I also have my R available. I have my Ignite available. Uh, and I'm coming, I think I just made a play bot or I hovered bot and I reset. I can't remember exactly what happened, but I'm coming out of base right now and I know my bot's about to reset. But then I pan my camera on the way back to mid. Remember, I'm a shark. I'm trying to smell where that blood is in a way. And I see that top's a heavy trading melee versus melee matchup. So you'll see in a second, I keep panning my camera. Hmm, interesting what's happening. Because I know I can't make a play bot right now. They're just resetting. So just continually panning my camera top. Again, so I come mid and I decided, you know what? They're actually heavy trading. He's very overextended. Um, I have a Camille with a lot of gank set up. You know what? I'm actually just going to hover. So I just hover. I walk my way up. I sense blood. I see they're heavy trading. Boom. I'm coming from out of vision from the side. Now I wait for him to use his gap closer. Boom. And I pick up a nice little kill. That's exactly the shark mindset. I sensed a little bit of, you know, a bit of, a bit of action. Boom. I'm going in and executing, cleaning up that kill. Same thing here. I'm in a tough lane. I know that we're slowly losing this game because my, I think my team's getting pretty annihilated here. And then I pan my camera top. I see that they've got, I believe the, um, the Nidalee had Rift and I knew that my top laner just died and I thought it was highly likely they're going to continue to go here and they're quite low. And I have double M, Tomb, Alt and Ignite. So what do I do? Screw it. I'm going to walk top. I smell action. I smell blood. Some blood in the water. So I walk up. I'm nice and healthy. I have plenty of resources. Boom. I've come from the side. And I'm able to get a beautiful little collapse into a double kill. Look at that. That is the shark mindset. There's no such... I'm, I'm not focusing on my lane. Sure, I'm taking... You know, I'm, I'm focusing on my trades, I guess. But I'm still trying to be aware of what's happening around the map. Because Vex is amazing at shoving and moving or simply moving to plays like this. Because of how the ultimate actually works. So this is what I want you guys to have a go. Guys and girls, I want you to have a go with in your own games. So now what we're going to do is take a look at R usage and give you a bunch of differing ways to optimize your R usage, things to think about, and actually mistakes to look out for with your R usage in your own reviews. Now tip number one, using R from out of vision and waiting them for you for them to use the gap closer. This is the exact same example we saw from before with the shark mindset. I'm out of vision. Very important because they're not actually anticipating my R. And the other part of this is you want to make sure they're using their gap closer. If you're facing any champion that has a gap closer, you've got to factor that in. Now remember, the underlying, I guess, mindset that has to be the, you know, the back of your mind every single time is I cannot afford to miss my R. Exact same thing when playing TF. If I miss my R and I don't get value from my R, I'm up shit creek. I'm in trouble. I'm in big, big, big trouble because of how ultimate reliant my champion is. So this is why I'm always trying to come out from, from out of vision. I'm trying to overwhelm their mental stack or I'm trying to make them confused or come from a, an angle where they're not going to think about me or again, most importantly, wait for them to use their gap closer so they can't actually avoid it. This could have easily been an absolute disaster. If I actually walked up here and use it now, Aatrox would have eared. I would have missed it. They know where I am. They know I have no ultimate. I get no value. It's an absolute disaster. It could be game losing. Next one, using R in multi-threat situations. This is the most important R fundamental out of all of them. 
Now, what I mean by this, what exactly is multi-threat? Multi-threat is essentially, you know, threat is something I talk a lot about in my videos. Threat means, you know, that person is feeling pressured or threatened from a certain member. Okay. Now in most common scenarios, especially in the early game, it's just you versus another person. So right now, if you think about it in the heat of the moment, Jarvin is directing most of his actual attention, the way he's looking on the screen and his mind. I view it as like a funnel. He's focusing attention here. That's where his mind is actually, he's factoring in information. He's probably trying to stay away from the, from the wall with the condemn, maybe trying to stay away, trying to push him, move himself to the tower. So he gets pushed into the tower by the Hecarim, maybe trying to avoid like a soraka E, whatever it might be. This Jarvan is thinking predominantly of things that are happening in this area. Now, if I'm coming from this area, I, I'm in a way in his blind spot. It's very difficult for him to process information coming from two differing angles which means that it's easier for me to land my R because they're just not going to avoid it. So now I'm coming from the side, I'm able to land a nice little R. That's the way I like to think about multi-threat. Now this is an interesting one. This one you could borderline say isn't multi-threat, multi -threat, but it kind of is at the same time. Now to get a little bit of context, I'm kind of coming from out of vision behind my vein. My vein is quite strong, but I see they're all tunneling on my vein. Now, theoretically, it is multi-threat because they're not really expecting my R to come from behind the vein. And I know my Hecarim's coming in from the side. So maybe they were thinking about Hecarim potentially flanking them. But it's the same premise in the sense that you want, to, you want the enemy's mental stack to be completely overwhelmed. They can't process all this information because right now, Anivia's probably thinking, oh my God, uh, Vayne's going to go on me. Hecarim's coming from the side. I know this guy, they're all focusing on this guy. So sometimes always in these situations, I can kind of come from behind an R because there's just too much information to process. So they end up working out, but ideally I'm coming from a different direction like this. My team's on the Baron. They're directing their attention all the way over here and look where I am. Boom. They're not going to be able to. They're not going to be able to react, even if this person had the reaction times to react. If they knew I was there, because they don't know I'm here, you would have to be superhuman to be able to avoid this one, especially if you're directing most of your attention to the team to the left. Same thing, and this is the way I think in most mid games. I want to be sitting off to the side, waiting for them to direct their attention elsewhere, which allows me to get onto their back line straight away. Pretty straightforward. Now, if you have been very conservative with your R throughout the game, which generally is the case, um, like you haven't really been using it, you've been holding onto it a lot throughout the game, sometimes what I'll actually do is I'll just walk up and I'll just randomly use it because they never would think I would use it. If I'm holding my R a lot throughout the game and being very conservative, sometimes you can randomly just walk up point blank and use it because like, nah, Vex hasn't used the ult like that the entire game. So sometimes you can actually just do these really stock standard front to back ones. Now, this is a tip that isn't really for beginners. I would say if you're a more advanced Vex player, this is something you can experiment with. The premise is still the same. Um, now, if you're in lane at a very close range, because the R is quite, it's quite a fast projectile. It's like, I think it's the same speed as a Lux Q um, from, from memory. Um, it can be quite difficult for the enemy to react, especially if they're not expecting it. So you'll see here in a second when I play this clip, I'm trying to masquerade my movements such that I, I'm trying to make it as, make the RE feel as though I'm simply playing for farm rather than um, alt. So here I go for like a trait and then I walk back. See you in a second. I walk back, then turn around with R. See that? It's because I know, I think, I remember here that um, Ari had no R. So I, I felt like I had a little all in window. So what I was trying to do, I was trying to confuse her by pretending I'm going to go backwards and then overwhelm her by instantly using my R while pathing backwards. Very similar to say like the Casio R flash or Casio going back and forward and randomly using R. Now in this case, I used it. Now, and this is why it's not for, for not for beginners, because if I use this and I miss it, again, I'm in a I'm in a, I'm in a big hole now. I'm in a really really big hole. I don't want to use my R like this and miss it. So if you're feeling confident, you feel like you got a read on the enemy and you get a solo kill, sure. But I would rather you be a lot more conservative with it. The classic one, following up on CC, pretty straightforward. You can also juggle tower aggro in this situation. I take aggro. And then I R, and then I re-aggro, boom. In this case, Camille dies, but you know, you can see the point. Um, big mistakes. So now we're gonna go over the big mistakes, big R mistakes that I see both in my, myself occasionally, in my own reviews, and also more importantly with uh, coaching clients. 
The first one, rushing R after the first reset. So let's say someone plays a bunch of Vex and you know they're really focused on their pre-fight positioning, which is a common learning objective. I said a lot of Vex players, I say, look, man, you really need to focus on coming or getting yourself in a nice angle before the fight. So here, I thought they were going to play for the dragon. So I'm sitting off to the side here. I focus all of my attention on that. So then I'm like, ah, oh, great. And I'm really poised. I get my first ultimate. Great. Now I get all excited. I get that dopamine hit. And I'm like, go, go, go. Next R. Oh. And then I miss it. Oh, it's just like, you know, it can be game losing again. So my advice is I would urge you to like, just wait a second, but calibrate, don't rush. Like most of the time in this situation, they're going to be anticipating the immediate R. Worst case scenario, you just chill. Sit off to the side. It t your R stays on cooldown for a long time. You have plenty of time to use it. And this gives you time for your ability to come back out. But anyway... Just relax, hold it for a little bit, calibrate, don't rush into the second one, don't let your dopamine and your, your emotions get a hold of you. So you'll see it here again. Get the kill, get all excited, and you'll see in a second, I think Zillion chops, shows up, and boom, instantly use it. Just hold, relax, Curtis, relax. Anyway. Um, not overwhelming the enemy, enemy mental stacks. Same thing before. Ideally, you're coming in from an angle where they're not anticipating your R. Now, in this situation, I got a little bit cocky. I'm coming in very linearly. And, of course, they're going to avoid it. So, in this situation, you really, want, you really want to avoid just using R like this. Because it's so easy for them to avoid it. Another one, low value R's. Sometimes, you, you know, you're going to be feeling pretty confident. Your team's ahead, you're ahead, and you're thinking, oh, you know, I can one-shot anyone. I've got my lost chapter. I've got my socks. I can one-shot anyone. You get a little bit crazy. Now here, I mean, I'm a mile away. She knows where I am. There's no, me there's no mental stack overload. There's no multi-threat going on. It's a low value kill in general. It's on a support who's, I think, already behind. Just don't do this. You know, really think about what you're actually going to get from using your R. And remember, very similar to many other champions of the game, simply the threat of R itself can completely change how the enemy play the game. If I use my R here and I miss it, now for the next, what, minute and a half or whatever it is, they're going to know I don't have R. So they can position however they want. They know I'm basically not a champion anymore. Got to be very careful. Understand the value you're getting from an R. Now, this one is not the best example, but you kind of get the point. When I'm going to some of these skirmishes, you need to actively think about the direction you're fearing the enemy. So ideally, when I get engaged upon, what I would ideally do if I have time is actually E behind the Nautilus here, which pushes the Nautilus into my team rather than Wing instantaneously because I don't really need the shield. He's quite immobile. If I just E, boom, he comes into my team. It just guarantees the kill. Now, if they have mobility and you feel as though they can flash it, it can be quite dangerous because then if you E behind and they flash here, they go even further that way. So there is risk, but if you're versing in a mobile champion that you know doesn't have flash and you're face checking or you know you're heading to a skirmish, you know, be quite, at least be cognizant of what can happen with your fear direction. At least try and optimize it, something to think about. So hopefully this gives you a little bit to think about when it comes to your R usage, guys. Now for some mid-game advice. So in mid-game, guys, keep it really simple. Most of the time, you're just going to be shoving and moving. In this case, I've broken the mid-tower. I want to help facilitate my bot lane. So I shove, I move, I sweep, I pink, and I just hover. I just hover out of vision. If I can hover out of vision like this, what's going to happen? Either or, they come follow, they face check, we one-shot, or they try and kill the Samira, and they walk up in that lane, we collapse, we kill, or nothing happens, we hover out of vision, we free space for Samira to get the tower and farm, and then it's fine, we can swap the lane assignments, do whatever. Shoving and moving, and at least simply shoving and hovering, is a really effective tool here. Now Lux comes by, we one shot, boom, they collapse into the Samira, gives me another opportunity to go in, boom. Really straightforward stuff. Shoving and hovering is the way to go. Burn the Zillion Flash, and same thing, when your team is sieging, if you feel as though they're sieging or a fight is about to happen, just shadow your team off to the side. Sweep around the corner, sit off to the side, and then if they fight the tower, you're gonna have a beautiful dive window, and then we can just clean up. Really straightforward stuff. 
Now, ideally you're balancing farming with grouping. So in a perfect world, what you'd be doing is something like this. You go to the side lane, your team kind of hovers you temporarily. You kind of collect the wave, get the tower, and then you kind of shadow them. You shove the wave in and hover your team. So right now I see that it looks like to be a potential fight in the, in the, uh, in the jungle. And then I go to the fight. So I'm not just gonna mindlessly sit here and split push. I'm not an Echo, I'm not a Fiora, I'm not a Trindamir. But you know, if I shove and move, I'm getting the I'm getting the best of both worlds. I'm getting a little bit of farm. I can also get the flank and come in late to fights. And coming in late to fights is completely fine with Vex. And now I'm able to get a great angle and I'm able to clean up here. Pretty straightforward. Um, now look, I think I did, I think I spoke about this in my uh, Kiana guide as well. You will often die getting into creative positions in mid game. Now I remember here I was thinking, see how I'm just trying to sweep. I'm just trying to sweep around the area. This was actually when there was like the invisibility here. I'm trying to get myself in a good position, but my team get caught and I'm thinking, oh great, this looks like a really good all-in window. I'm just gonna wait for my R, I'm not gonna clean, clean up the graves and then an army. This is great. So I'm trying to just camp out of vision in a really awkward spot for the enemy. But then Ash actually comes around and spots me and then I die. And then I look like, you know, it, it looks really embarrassing, right? But the intention was there. The intention was that I'm trying to hover around the side sweep, get myself into a nice little flank position so that I can back up my team. But it just so happens that they spot me, my team engage a little bit too early, you know. So this will happen. This is very normal. If this happens to you, don't worry. It's it's part of the learning journey. Now, one thing I really want to point out is that Edge of Night and Banshees is a big, big, big counter to Vex. It will literally change the way you have to play your mid game. So here, right, I'm actually trying to sit off to the side and flank, right? So I thought the enemy was gonna come in, so I'm trying to sit off to the side and maybe look for an engage. But the enemy Kha'Zix is looking for me, has Edge of Night, there's nothing I can do. I can't peel myself. If I use my W, he's not gonna get feared. I mean, if it ever had fear value, he wouldn't get feared. There's nothing I can do. I can't kill this guy, I can't one-shot the guy, I can't fear the guy. It's so difficult for me, and I'm basically always gonna have to flash. So if you're versing champions that have a Edge of Night, that have Edge of Night, you might have to change the way you play mid game rather than sitting off to the side. You might have to simply just play front to back. Um, force them to come into you and sit on top of your AD carry and play front to back. You do have to adapt every now and then. So something to keep in mind, it is a, an item uh, that will change Vex's identity big time. So to add on a little bit with team fighting, in a really simple fashion, there are two overarching ways you can play team fights as Vex. On the left hand side, we have peel, and on the right hand side, we have dive. Look, we're gonna go deeper on this in the VOD section, but I think that if you understand the Vex fundamentals, like the hovering out of vision, um, you're understanding who you're paired with on your team, understanding fear usage, W usage, all this sort of thing, team fighting will largely be intuitive for you. But what I'm looking for in a lot of these games, and when I'm kind of going into these games and playing the games, I'm really looking how the game is playing out and what champions I'm paired with and what I'm against. If I'm against dive-oriented champions, well, that's like a, a strike in the, the column of, I should probably peel, because I can peel these champs really effectively, and if my team's getting dove, it's very hard for me to dive. Um, so usually I'm sitting front to back. But if I have these champions on my team, and they're looking to actually primarily engage, then most of the time I'm gonna be sitting off to the side and then, you know, looking to be follow up engage. So it really does, do, it, like when you're looking to dive versus peel, I'm mainly looking what I'm with, if I'm looking to dive, but if I'm looking to peel, it's more what I'm against, if that makes sense. So it's a little bit complicated, we'll go deeper on this later, but this is the way I really want you to be thinking about, as with team fighting, sorry. Now moving on to most common mistakes. A really, really common one is rushing fears and not utilizing the threat of the fear itself. Going back to the level one, level two trades, what I see with a lot of Vex players, they do this. They see the enemy over here, farming, say this is the Vex here, and like, all right, they see that the, the, the fear bar charge up. As soon as it gets to like the top and it goes red, they literally la -di -da -di -da, walk up and they just look, it's just so linear. You know, the enemy knows exactly what the Vex is doing. So well, the enemy's like, well, no shit, you're looking for a fear. So I'm just gonna walk back. I'm gonna sit on the max range of that E and then you're never even gonna be able to proc the passive. Very, very common mistake. So what you wanna be doing is you wanna be walking up on that tie rope on the edge of the E range and going back and forth. That way you're gonna be utilizing the threat of the fear itself to maybe deny the enemy farm, make them scared, make them hesitate. And at some point they're gonna be a bit frustrated, they're gonna overstep and then you can, you can capitalize appropriately. We see this both in the early lane, we see it in mid game as well. People rushing fear, 
Um, not prepping their fear before fights, a very common one. Um, another one, because Vex has like this very AOE functionality oriented style towards CSing, like just with the EQ through the entirety of the wave, it's very easy to get complacent and have this blase approach to CSing. I myself am guilty of this at times. I think my CS should be much higher in a lot of games. Um, this is something that you are going to have to address at some point. It's probably not the most important thing to focus on, but at some point you're going to have to address it. Um, going in too early in fights, again, when you're Vex, you really want to overwhelm the enemy mental stack. The longer you wait, in a way, the better it can be because they're going to have to think, oh my god, when's Vex going to go in? When's Vex going to go in? So if your team's on an objective, they're in the dragon pit like this, and you're sitting off to the side, you really want to milk the fear that you're instilling into the enemy. You don't want to rush it. You want to wait till they, that they overstep, and once they overstep, then you can capitalize. Going in too early is a very big theme. Not having fear available for R, not thinking about stacking it before fights or conserving it, pretty straightforward. And the last one here, failing to identify win cons. And this will be one that we go deep into in the VOD review section. Now for matchup tier list, look, I just, I don't even like tier lists, guys. Like I made this very clear. T tier lists is so hard to actually make when it comes, to, especially when a champ like Vex, when you're not even played for the 1v1. So what I tried to do is I tried to take into account both the enemy strategy holistically and how it interacts with Vex's strategy as well as laning. So I've kind of, you know, put it into these categories. For example, Akshan is a very complicated one because theoretically Akshan can't kill you, but you can't kill Akshan, which, which means most of the time Akshan is just going to get priority, which means he can theoretically shove and move. Now, does that mean it's necessarily unfavorable? Yeah, well, yes, I think holistically in the game it is unfavorable because you can't prevent Akshan from roaming. And in the mid game, it can be a little bit annoying as well, in the side lane specifically. But it doesn't mean he can kill you, you know, so you can see how these are really, it is a little bit awkward. These ones down here though, you, a lot of the time, you're just gonna get annihilated in lane. Like Casio will, can just run at you and kill you. A lot of these low cooldown control majors, they're gonna outrange you, they're gonna bully you, they have way lower cooldowns. It's nasty. It's really, really nasty. But um, if you have any questions about any of these, let me know. We're going to be covering plenty of these in the VOD review section, so um, stay tuned. So I've got a few extra notes. Um, these are important details that I felt I, as though I had to add in. So let's take a look at what these are now. So the things in this extra note section are parts of Vex that you need to understand that they don't really fit anywhere else in the guide. I don't really know what to call them. So the first one here is that, you know, when you can't hit R due to the enemies, they, them having flash, they have too much mobility and they know exactly where you are, you can just go for flash W. It's a lot more reliable and that can allow you to land your R afterwards and then remove that target. Um, something that I don't use too much, um, but it is definitely important. Now, in this situation, if you actually look at this skirmish and play it out, you actually look at a lot of people will ask, well, why are you holding your R? Why aren't why not using R? A lot of people ask that question. Now, in this situation, I don't use R because I don't have any abilities and there's no one I can actually kill. Now, think about it. If I actually R the Lee, what am I going to do? I don't know if he's going to get low enough for me to, uh, for me to die. I know Hecarim has no abilities. Even if Ekrim were to go in, it's not going to be enough for me to kill. Look at this, because I have nothing to follow up with, and I would have just wasted my R. So it's better for me in this situation if I know if I either have no abilities or I know that I can't actually clean up or I can't get the reset on that target or I can't kill that target. There's no point in me using R. I might as well conserve it, see how the fight plays out. Again, overwhelm the enemy mental stack. And here I thought I could get a nice little sneaky R onto the, the, the Zaya, but it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Even if I hit it, it wouldn't change the fight. But you get the premise. A lot of the time, again, I would urge you to be on the side of holding your R a little bit more, calibrating, looking at who's getting targeted, waiting for your abilities to come up. And when you know that you can kill someone, then you use the second R. Really got to get yourself into the habit of holding that second R. Very important. Now, there are harsh realities of holding R. This is a classic moment where I'm trying to hover and shadow my jungler who's going for an invade. Now, he just goes for a little bit of a collapse on the lead. Now, you'll see me here, kind of hovering out of vision. Now, I have R. Now, in this situation, I'm weighing up between two things. One, do I even need to R? Isn't Lee just, I thought Lee was just dead. Do I even need to R? Think, because remember, I want to conserve my R as much as possible. If I don't need to use it, I don't want to use it because it's such an integral part of my champion's kit. 
The other thing is because I'm at quite long range and it's kind of coming in from the same direction, I don't believe I'm necessarily overwhelming the mental stack of the Lee Sin. Like I'm not coming in from a random direction and it's just very long range. It's very unreliable. And I don't know which way Hecarim's actually going to push the Lee Sin because, and I don't know where the fight is going to go. When I'm at a long range like this, I don't, and I don't know which direction the fight is going to go. It's really unreliable for me to hit it. So I just hold it. I hold, I hold, I hold, thinking, oh, okay, he's probably dead. I hold, but then he survives, and then I die. This will happen a lot. This will happen a lot, guys. So my takeaway from this situation is that it's largely noise. I don't regret my decision. I actually don't. Because the, the, the information I had at the time, it is so close. And, and the way Hecarim in, like, interacts, he's going to have eyes, he's going to push in certain directions. I don't know which way Lee's going to go. What I should have done, my adaptation should have been, I should have sat in this brush, you know, then feared the Syndra, then ran away. That should have been my takeaway. But I don't regret not using my R here. You've got to be realistic with yourself. Is it even possible for you to land that R? Very important. Um, this, okay, I want to clarify the difference between multi-threat and non-multi-threat because I think some people conflate the two. So this is a team fight where I actually think is not multi-threat. So if you actually take a look at this, four of our members are on this side and then Hecarim's kind of coming up from behind, like you'll see on the minimap here, kind of coming up from around those wolves. Now the problem with this is that, yes, we do have a lot of dive, like I guess Warwick is dive, Rakan is dive, we're all dive in a way, but... We're all coming in from a similar direction because by the time we can actually follow up, look at this. We're all theoretically, we're all coming in from a very similar direction. Like they, they're not, it's not like anyone's flanking or coming in from any of these random directions. We're all somewhat in the same vicinity. And because Ekram's so far away from everyone else, there's no multi-threat actually occurring here. I can't get onto the back line. I can't R onto anyone onto the back line. So it was very difficult for me to do anything. So then I'm forced to play the front to back. I mean, to be honest with you, I probably should have just here R'd the Zillion and one-shot the Zillion. And then that way would have forced him to ult himself or even one-shot him and he wouldn't got his ult off. But this is an example of a fight where it looks good on paper. Like it looks good, but it's actually not in reality because there's no multi-threat going on. We're all just funneling into them in one direction. Zaya gets a massive ult. This is the difference. This is multi-threat. Hecarim's coming in from one direction. And I think this is Rakan coming in from this direction as well. And then me and Trista coming from this direction. This is multi-threat. Look at that. That is, this is multi-threat. Literally different directions. Hecarim's literally looped around this way and gone that way. And I'm coming from this way. Literally pincering. That is multi-threat. That's a great team fight. So that's why pre-fight positioning is probably the single, one of the most important concepts for you to understand and master if you're going to play a champion like like Vex, because otherwise you're just not going to be impactful. All right, so these are a few extra notes. Hopefully this expands on some of the things we've covered so far in the guide, but um, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, guys. So keeping it very simple, if you were to learn Vex, you know, you don't need many games. I remember when I did the Kiana guide, this was like, I think 70 or 80 games. You should be basically getting to a very high level with Vex, 30, 35, 40 games in. It won't take long. It's a very straightforward champion. So for the first 15 games, you just want to limit test. You know, limit test your early trading combos with the EQ auto, send it at level six, see how much damage you can do with your fear, get familiar with how the fear stacks work and actually feel out how, how fast it stacks up and actually just get familiar with constantly looking at your fear bar. Play around very basically with fog of war, feel out the wave clear values and the differing breakpoints. Um, 15 to 30 games, you want to start to pay attention to your pre-fight positioning, really honing in on your pre-fight positioning, identifying members on your team that you can facilitate slash follow up on a secondary engage, playing around with side lane dives and opportunistic roams with that shark mindset, really focusing on staying out of vision in mid game, utilizing that fog of war, the sweeper, pinks, and begin to, to develop patience with your ability usage, especially the R, especially after the first R, the second R you want to really develop, start developing that patience. When you're 30 plus games deep, you actually probably want to go back to your early lane and optimize your E threat usage, like walking that tightrope, but kind of going to the edge and tethering and spacing and getting more comfortable with landing those E's or forcing the enemy come into you. You want to tighten up your early lane phase hypothesis, getting very granular, um, understanding how you can be maximally effective in, in fights. So when you say you do win a fight, let's say you dive the back line and you win a fight, you should probably go back to that fight and say to yourself, did I need to dive or could we actually, would, they, would we have won this fight harder if I peeled? 
That's a very important question to ask yourself when you're going deeper into VEX. Look for roam opportunities and understand the value of rooms. If you if you go for a roam somewhere, look at what you lose on the other side of the map or look at what opportunities you miss out on if you go for that roam. Like if I am dive my top lane jacks, but then I leave my bot lane exposed, I need to ask myself, well, maybe it was better for me to not go top here, to leave the jacks win by himself and then just just hover bot and then if i help my, my bot lane win we're probably going to win the game anyway just start to think more holistically about what value you're getting from your roams and then skirmish optimization creative hovers etc um we'll get into this later on now for game reviews i'm going to do things a little bit differently today guys we're going to do a quick short lane review of a game where i played versus a zoe then we're actually going to look at the early end of RGS. Now, I in the Midland Academy Discord, someone linked this YouTube video, and it was a YouTube video of RGS. I actually don't know who he is. I think he's like an NA mid laner or something, and he's in, he's playing that Champions Q thing, and he uploaded a VOD where he was playing uh, Vex into Victor, and I was watching it just out of interest. I'm doing this Vex, and I'm like, wow, this is a great example of how to fl basically flawlessly minimize a tough matchup. He was versing Jojo Pyun. It was a really, really nice lane. So I actually want to review this early lane um, to show you guys some beautiful early lane um, execution. Then I want to also do a mid-game review of a game where I versus Silas. And then I want to go through a full game review of me versing Alux. I tried to get a widespread of differing matchups to really get you guys understanding differing types of games you have with Vex. And then at the end, I'm just going to leave you an actual short Platinum 1 coaching session I did um, with a Vex versus Zed. From the MLA. I thought that's something interesting that you guys would actually enjoy as well. So hopefully there's something for everyone here. Um, if you want to look at the lane, the mid games, the full games, the coaching, there's something here for everyone. So um, let's dive straight in guys. All right, so this is the first little lane review. This is me playing Vex into Zoe. This was actually a pro player we have in, in, in Os. Um, this is a bit of a tricky matchup. And now there are multiple ways to play it. You can play it nice and conservative, holding the wave in the middle, playing neutral state, slowing it down a little bit, simply playing to survive and get to your level six. Um, I could have theoretically put it onto my side and played for gank setup with the Rek'Sai, but I'm like, you know what? I'm actually going to play to win this matchup. This is a very high skill cap way of playing Vex. You're about to see using offense as my defense, really relying on my micro, um, to win. Now you'll see from level one, I'm already willing to heavy trade. I'm already willing to take damage to do damage. I'm standing outside the wave to make Zoe make a choice between me queuing me or queuing the wave. This way I can guarantee the shelf, standing my ground with auto attacks and C pots. I know that Kane has very little threat onto me anyway, so I don't really need to be scared. And my hypothesis was to get level two first, push the pace of the lane and make the Zoe really uncomfortable because Zoe as a champion, it does. He, she doesn't like getting shoved in. It's very hard for her to land her abilities if you have the minion advantage. Now this E is disastrous. What I should be doing in theory, is walking up, getting into E range, walking back and forth, very clicking close to my character, overwhelming her mental stack, waiting for her to maybe overstep for a last hit or something, then E auto. But what I do instead, she baits me out a little bit. I thought she was gonna walk walk in front of me here um, to get her passive auto onto me. She faked me out and then baited out my E, which was really good micro from her. Um, but still, same thing, kind of standing my ground, willing to heavy trade and proc my electro, making sure that I have the minion advantage. Now I know that I'm gonna get level two first. You see me posturing aggressively already. Boom, fishing for an EQ. Now, there's many times where I probably wouldn't EQ here because I don't actually have my fear available. Most of the time I would wait for my fear to come up then EQ, but because I have the immediate level two versus level one, I'm like, screw it, I'm gonna send it. I just wanna heavy trade because I can maybe get a kill here because she's put herself into a little bit of a corridor here. Now I could have flashed and autoed her and killed her, but I wanted to conserve my flash and I felt like I'm already in such a good position here. Um, I don't need to flash after, I'm probably gonna kill her soon anyway. I was a bit of a wasted Q there. I probably should have been EQing the wave here just to make sure I get the wave in because this wave set's a little, it's a little awkward, but not too bad. And I remember here, um, you'll see in a second, I ping mid and I ping that Zoe has no flash or able to dive. Now, just for reference, this is this is a very high skill cap way of playing Vex. I wouldn't recommend playing Vex like this for beginners. This is only if you're quite confident in your micro, um, your you're versing a low threat jungler, or you have very good jungle tracking. This is not something I would recommend for the average player. Um, so like I said, to reiterate, if I were playing this, if I was a beginner or a platinum player or whatever, I'd probably keep the wave in neutral state, just relax, 
stand behind the minions, use the minions to block the Q damage, play more conservative. Now here I messed up big time. I should have 110% immediately reset right now. I shouldn't have touched this wave. I should have reset, come back and got my Dark Seal. Now the reason this is actually very important is because I don't want to get shoved in by Zoe unless I'm actively playing to set up ganks, which I could theoretically because I have a Rek'Sai. But I would much rather just independently win the lane in this situation and allow my Rek'Sai to gank sides. In which case I should have insta reset. That way I would have been able to match the tempo some what and then i would have been able to get the shove out again and then continu continuously push the pace of the lane but i end up greeting staying for two whole waves zoe comes back which makes it really hard for me so um she ends up trying to push me off the wave it doesn't really matter and then up recent getting dark seal tier one boots now fast forwarding a little bit to keeping it very related to vex fundamentals she's kind of got the minion advantage right now so i'm kind of getting shoved not much i can do I know Kane's on top side, but I still thought there wasn't much threat here onto me. Zoe walks past the wave. I end up using my W reactively. I get a little bit chunked. I, to be honest, I didn't expect Gali to come. I, I thought that he wouldn't roam this early, but it is what it is. Okay. So, not too bad. Now the wave is bouncing out a little bit, and you'll see what I do. Now when my fear's up, fish for an EQ. I actually eat as the fear was coming up here, which is quite nice. Like, can sometimes catch the enemy off guard, end up missing it. Now, I just take the heavy trade. I miss the E anyway, but I've got plenty of C pots and the wave's in a good spot and I get the value from the W shield. So I'm able to kind of walk past the wave and look for a nice little trade. And notice here, I, I'm fishing for a, a low percentage Q anyway, because I have plenty of resources and, you know, why not? It's on a relatively low cooldown. Now, I know that Zoe has no flash. I have both sums because I was able to conserve my flash from before. My fear is about to come up. And now she's in kill threat range, so you'll see in a second. I'm looking for a potential E angle, and if she disrespects, I can even flash W. Boom, flash over. Pretty straightforward. Probably didn't even need to ignite there. I think I would have got the kill with the final auto attack. But um, it looks like I panicked a little bit and got the kill. But you see, this is how I could use the Flash W. So if you're versing someone that has something like an Ari Charm, something like that, you can use your Flash W as a way to guarantee kills. Now, the final thing I will add on to this one, just to kind of reiterate some of the, the uh, Vex fundamentals. Um, straight away, I get my Sorks. I got my Dark Seal. And now I'm sitting out of vision. Now I know Zoe has no flash. So I'm sitting from out of vision, waiting for Zoe to shove the wave and then I can collapse. I walk over here to fake that I'm not contesting to keep her interested. Then I I uh, kind of force her against the wall in a way. And then I'm able to ask, there's no way she's gonna avoid it. And then she's just dead again. So at this point it's kind of end of review. So the main point of this review, what I wanted to get across is this is an example of the fast paced, aggressive, mechanically intensive style. So you can theoretically win lanes with Vex, even though it's not something I would recommend for the average player. Once you start to get a little bit more comfortable, you can play Vex like this. Just requires a lot of jungle awareness. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of context to playing a more fast paced offensive defense style Vex. So this is a VOD I got linked in the MLA Discord of uh, RJS, I think he's like a, an NA Challenger player versus Jojo Puen in Champions Q. And when I clicked on this, I, you know, I was, I was interested to see the early lane. And this was up there with some of the best Vex landing that I've actually seen across any server. Um, I was really, really, really impressed. The ability to minimize this tough matchup, especially when the victor goes time warp, airy, you know, biscuits, that sort of thing. It's not easy. It's very tough. So he's actually opted in for TP this game, which makes sense, I'm assuming, because Champion Skew is a little bit slower and you're just going to get straight up bullied in this matchup. And if you don't take Ignite, you're going to get choked out. They're probably going to freeze and you're going to go down a metric ton of farm. So I respect the fact that he's actually gone TP. It makes sense, at least for the for the lane um, and in Champion Skew. So we'll take a look. I think this is a great example of minimizing a tough matchup. Now, one thing that's really interesting is that he... Victor came to lane late, so he was actually able to get a few autos on the wave level one, which is very important because I actually feel as though if Victor was at, at, in the lane level one and Vex wasn't able to get these auto attacks on the wave, I think Victor would definitively be able to get level two first and potentially slow build or get the minion advantage into the Vex, which would make Vex's life quite miserable. What I think RJS is doing, again, my interpretation of what he's doing, is he's trying to keep the wave in neutral state and kind of use his offense as defense. Similar to what I did before with the Zoe, but 
you can't be as aggressive into a Victor as you can be into a Zoe because Victor's cooldowns are quite lower. He's essentially using his offense as defense. He's never planning to kill the Victor. All he's trying to do is farm to the best of his ability, minimize damage taking, taken, trade a little bit of his HP for last hits, and then just come back with TP. He wants to make sure he gets to six safely as possible. Now, already from level one, like I said, he's auto-attacked it, which is going to allow him to match the level two. Um, he walks up, and one thing he does really well, he only ever takes the Q and never the passive auto from the Victor. Look, I think Jojo Pond should probably be posturing more aggressively and looking for that Q on the back end anyway, even at the expense of a heavy trade because his cooldowns are so much lower. And because Jojo Pond isn't getting the minion advantage, he's wasting time, and RGS is doing a really good job of spacing and not actually getting in Q range, um, he's actually able to just simply match and match the level two. And this is really, really nice spacing. Really nice spacing and never giving Victor the, the opportunity to follow up on that Q with the passive auto. And this is all predicated on the fact that he started autoing the lave level 1 ASAP. Very, very smart. Now look what he does here. He walks up, Joji Boon doesn't respect, and then boom, he's able to get the E behind the Victor, force him into him, and get a double auto to proc the Electro. Very, very nice. That was even through um, the, the Q shield there, which was, which was beautiful. Nice, nice. Very nice sidestep on the E there. And look at that, able to somewhat match level two, trading a little bit of his HP for the wave. You'll see here, he takes a bit of damage for the last hits. That's completely fine. Using E in a pretty reactive manner, not, not being very stingy with the way he uses E, constantly using it basically off cooldown so he can proc those E, proc the passive on the minion wave. Standing his ground very effectively. Look at that. And again, I, I'm assuming here he's probably thinking to himself, look, if I don't trade and I sit back, and I give access to the waves to Victor, I'm gonna get stacked on and it's gonna be so rough. Like I'm slowly gonna lose anyway. I might as well trade my HP early in the lane anyway, go back for like an early Dark Sill. That way, you know, I, I can force um, Victor to play my game and I can just survive to six. So really great stuff here. He's starting to get nailed a little bit by these E's and it will start to hurt as Victor gets more points in the E, but he's done a really great job here, minimizing damage. Max range Q. Wouldn't be surprised if he starts using W at times here to maybe minimize some of that damage. Looking for these high value E's so he can keep using that passive auto on the wave to match the shove. And I'm assuming he's probably going to go for a reset soon here anyway. He's probably trying to finish off this wave with a max range EQ and then probably reset, I'm assuming. Yep. Lovely. Look at that. Really, really solid. So yep, not, you know, he's not winning the matchup, like he's not dominating the matchup, but he's survived probably the one of the hardest pa uh, parts of this entire lane phase. So beautiful, comes back, goes for, he actually goes for an early Dorans. Now this is interesting. So when you're playing a fast paced lane, you can go Dorans for a little bit of an early damage spike. Durability gives you a bunch of everything. Sustain, a bit of, like, bit of mana, bit of durability with the AP, HP. Um, it's quite a solid purchase. I personally don't do it all that much in solo queue because I feel as though I get the same, a similar amount of durability with the Dark Seal and I like the snowballing effect of Dark Seal. But if you are in a really tough matchup and it's important for you to be able to match and play that pressure game, um, Dorans is quite effective. Now, Lee Sen comes mid knowing that Jojo Poon is kind of like overstayed a little bit trying to get that wave out. It looks like Jojo Poon's really trying to greed for the rest of that wave. I don't really know why, but ends up getting punished for it. I think here, if RJS actually flash W'd, I think here he should have actually flash W'd, which would have feared the victor this way, which would have allowed Lee Sin to land the Q and they would have one shot him. And then he would have even been able to get the prep. If, if Jojo Poon flashed, he would have got the extra proc with the passive as well. So I think this is a little bit of a blunder from him. Um, I think what he was hoping for is he was hoping to probably E behind, which would push him into the Lee, but um, he stopped to auto attack and he probably realized the spacing wasn't as good. I think you'll see, yeah, I think that's a bit of a misplay from RJS there, but still, you still get the flash from the Victor while conserving your flash, which is completely fine. Maybe he didn't want to blow flash because he wanted it for a team fight at level six or something, a play at level six, which potentially is the case. I, I can't read his mind. But still, Lane's in a beautiful... He's only down 6 CS, and the wave is kind of coming to his side. And he's burned Victor's Flash, so that's amazing. This basically guarantees that he's going to get to his level 6. So it looks like he's kind of pinging mid because he knows the wave's on his side. And this is kind of the benefit of, like, Champions Q. You can kind of communicate with your jungler and explain your intention. Um, but Jojo Pun reads the play, knows his wave is cooked, so he's able to ward out that gank. So this is where the lane will get a little bit tricky because now the wave's on his side and he's getting poked. Um... So it'll be interesting to see what he does here. 
Okay, so he's trying to thin out the wave a little bit. Yeah, so this is where it gets nasty. And notice how he uses that W. Look at that. He uses the W to mitigate some of the damage on the back end from the, from the Q. Look at that. Quite nice. But yeah, this is, this is much harder than before. You can already notice straight away. When you're getting shoved in like this, it feels terrible. Because your cooldowns are so much longer than Victor. Or significantly longer than the Victor. And you're just getting poked. So he's got to sit tight. He's got to survive. Farm to the best of your ability. He's farming okay. You mean 32 CS by 5 minutes. Not not amazing. 33 CS by 5 minutes. Not amazing. But it's it's solid. Very solid. So now he has no more seaports. So it wouldn't surprise me if he just bases on a cannon. Shoves a wave and bases on a cannon. One thing that I would like to see here is... Even if Jojo Boon froze, I wouldn't care. Like... Just, just get it to the best of your ability. You can't really, you don't have a choice. Looks like he's going to go for like a Q and then he just resets again. Yep, so he's going to get frozen on a little bit. He has to accept reality. So not too bad. Again, now he's got that Dark Seal. He's got that tier one boots. Uh, Victor has no flash. So what you'd be ideally looking for as Vex in this situation is just river skirmishes, dragon fights. That's what you're looking for. Um... So yep, he survived the early stage. He's just got his level six. He can EQ, EQ the wave, boom. And he's very fortunate. He, and one thing he did really well, he actually warded it before he went into lane just to make sure. I'm assuming Xin Zhao wasn't kind of hovering the area. And also probably generates threat with the Lee Sin because it's a pink. So well done, walks up, mitigates the damage with the W. And look at this, just walks straight into the river. This is exactly what Vex wants to do. Hover, Shadow, Shark Mindset, sees his bot lane stack in a wave, can look to potentially die bot here. Now, you don't always need to commit. Sometimes you can just hover halfway and then see. Looks like that's what he does. He kind of hovers, assesses the scenario, sees that they're not really needed. I think they probably got the kill anyway. Or Thresh's landing, so it's probably a hard dive. So um, he's already done the right thing, which is zone, most, zone them off the wave anyway and deny them the farm. And again, he's not planning to... I mean, this is a pretty... I'd say this is actually a pretty... Bad E. I think he should kind of walk up and fake it a little bit, or maybe even hold it to use offense as defense. I think these max range E's you really want to be careful of doing a bit nasty. Okay. And the great thing about this, because Victor's actually got no flash, Victor can't really push up too aggressively, especially now that um, Vex has got six. There's a lot of threat that Vex has. And now look at this. Beautiful. Lee Sin does the dragon. He can simply hover. And it's so scary for Victor to walk into this play because he's hovering off to the side. Look at this. Coming from out of vision. If Victor goes over here, boom, he has no flash. He's just going to get turned on and die. Very, very nice positioning here from, from Vex. Alternatively, what he probably could have done, he could have just walked in. Because like if he walks in here... Victor can't walk in anyway, and then that way he can maybe have more access onto the Xin Zhao and turn onto the Xin Zhao there. I feel like he could have done that as well, because that way, like, look at this. I mean, you could just go boom, or maybe walk up here, boom. That way it is a little bit sketchy. I think that he is a bit sketchy because Victor can collapse or whatever, but I think still it's hard for Victor to move, um, because again, him having no flash, and then you get turned on by the Lee Sin and, and the Vex. So there's an argument to be made that maybe you could have walked into the river, but he's playing it quite conservatively, setting off to the side, preventing Victor from walking in and looking at securing that dragon. So that's completely fine. I think here, he does the flash W, which allows uh, Lee Sin to follow up. Pretty straightforward. So overall, that's all I wanted to cover this early lane. I think that's where a lot of Vexes will struggle with in this matchup. And I think he did an excellent job. This is a borderline a masterclass on how to minimize this tough matchup. So props to RGS, man. Great stuff. Um, definitely need to check out some of his, his more VODs if he puts more of them in Champions queue. All right, so this is the game versus Silas. We're starting this VOD level nine, level nine in. Um, I want to talk about one little play here that ties into the shark mindset. And then we're going to really dive deep into the mid game stuff. A lot of mid game stuff. If you're struggling with your mid game, you know, you've got the lane pay, lane phase down pat. I think this is a really solid VOD view to watch. So, um, as we see pretty early, I mean, even early game, I'm zero, zero one farming. Okay. I've now got my lost chapter. I've got my, uh, blasting wand. <clears throat> And then I don't have ults, so I'm not really looking for a proactive play, but then a bot play happens and Silas has first move. Um, then I move. And remember, shark mindset. I see blood in the water. Everyone's heavy trading. So I just hover. Chances are this will happen in a lot of your games too. You're chilling, you're chilling, you're chilling. And then boom, they forget where you are. I'm able to clean up, get a nice little double kill. 
hold into a triple kill. And this is usually how I get into a lot of games. I'm playing nice and conservative, relaxing, and then before I know it, I um, I just get a random double kill. Because again, I have that shark mindset and I actually turn it into, I think into a quadra kill there, basically. So fast forwarding, I'm now officially snowballed. But directly after, I make one of the most cardinal sins you could possibly make with Vex. And we're going to break this down. I think a lot of people will also make this mistake. So I'm, I'm snowballed, right? I'm killing it. Me and, me and Kane are killing it. But what do we know? Dragon's coming up in 13, 15, around 15 seconds. But I don't have ultimate. I don't have ignite. It's only the second dragon, right? So what should I do? I'm hoping you guys behind your monitors are saying, give the dragon, don't fight, give the dragon. There's no need for me to fight it. Sure, me and Kane are strong, but I'm not that strong because I don't have ultimate. I'm very ultimate reliant. There's no rush. There's no rush here. But what do I do? I compensate. I remember actively thinking in the game that I don't want to fight this. I don't want, and I, what I should be typing in chat already, give drag, give drag. But no, I don't give drag. And I start pinging my ultimate in a second. I start pinging my ult and I'm thinking to myself, I don't want this. I really don't want this. And you'll see how I'm super hesitant because I'm like, oh, I don't want to walk in. Oh, I really don't want this. And I think I, I ping danger, danger, bit back, back. It's too late. Once someone has their eyes set on the prize like this, no matter how much you ping back, they're committed, they're in. And look what I do. I try to peel. I'm really confused. I don't understand my role in the fight. I'm hesitating. And I finally have my arm thinking, okay, maybe I can clean up because my mental sack is completely cooked and I'm fried right now. Like, like I, I, my brain isn't working because I don't know how I want to actually approach the fight because usually the, the, the 20, 30 seconds leading up to the fight, I'm thinking about what exactly I want to do. I'm thinking about my pre-fight positioning. I haven't done any of that because I didn't even want to fight. I compensate and then I get collapsed on and I die. Boom, just like that. I throw my lead. Silas gets a 450 shutdown, takes my ult, gets two kills. And then um, the game is now much, much harder than it needs to be. For all of you Vex players out there, if you don't have R, don't be afraid to call off the objective because remember, your champion is borderline useless without it. Now the game gets hard. Now the game gets much, much harder. Okay? So my bot lane kind of got destroyed. They lose their tower. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, lane assignments are probably going to get swapped up in a second. I can't really do much into the Silas right now, so I'm just going to, you know... Play Corp versus AI. I don't really want to interact here. Now, Kane walks into Top River, and I know the enemy bot lane actually resetting right now. Um, and I know Silas is also resetting. Then boom, I hover my member, uh, my strong member, because I know Kane is actually strong. I have ultimate. I have stopwatch. I'm not afraid. Even though the enemy AD carrying support here, it doesn't really matter to me because Silas is not here. Silas is the most important member. Um... I'm okay with this because Kane is one of my strong members. I peel back beautifully and we're able to get a nice little kill. Hold my R until I know 100% he doesn't have anything. And then we're able to turn this fight around into a beautiful little skirmish. Boom. 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 Okay, so pretty straightforward. So when I'm in, heading into mid game, I'm thinking about, is my R off cooldown? Where is the next fight going to be? Like, I'm thinking about the next objective, and how can I come around from the side? And you know, most importantly, who is my strong member? Who do I want to be playing around the most? And now, unfortunately, Silas gets another shutdown, and Silas is getting absolutely out of control. So sure, me and Kane are strong, but so is this Silas. All right, so is this Aphelios. So if you actually see, I'll see if I can pause it on the scoreboard in a second. Aphelios is getting quite strong and even building MR second. Silas is now 6-1. I don't even beat him in the side anymore. This is going to be rough, but the saving grace is that you know, Malphite's going to do a lot of work, and I would say Kane is also going to do a lot of work. So again, my reference point, I'm thinking, okay, all right, I'm thinking, all right, Kane's dead, I probably don't want to make a play right now, relax, wait for the next objective, or wait for Kane to come back on the map, swap up the lane assignments, catch sideways, and see here, I ping back on the rift, I ping back on the rift, I ping bot, because I don't want a play to happen there, but... I know something was likely going to happen, so I reset in preparation for a potential fight, and I get Zonya's. Very important second item. So look what I do. Instead of defaulting straight to the side lane because I've got that shark mindset, I'm looking around mid and I'm thinking, hmm, okay, there's a lot of people grouping mid. I don't really need to immediately answer a side lane right now, so I mean, you know what? I'm actually just going to shadow my team, and I talk a lot about this in mid game. Hovering your team, shadowing your team. It's very important with Vex because you can clean up very easily with your R. So I just run down mid. I just shadow. Because there's a lot of people hovering around mid. It looks a little bit suspicious. And then, you know, 
look, look at what we see. Boom, they engage. Coming in late to the fight. Excellent. Wait, making sure that I know exactly where everyone is. Boom. Front to back. I know they can't react to that. And we have, now we're able to clean up. Look at that. So I could have easily, you know, there's an argument to be made that going bot would make more sense because Silas is shoving out that wave, but no. I've developed my, you know, my my smelling here. I know that something is likely up and the sign here is that everyone's kind of grouping around mid. This this Zinzao is a bit of a, a psycho. You know, I, he, I know this guy, he's probably going to go in. Um, so I, I, I called their bluff and I knew that a fight was likely going to happen. And, and, and worst case scenario, if it doesn't happen, I can always like, well, once I'm here, I can always just go bot after. It's, it's no big deal. But hovering your team is largely going to pay dividends in a lot of your games. So play around with it, guys. So we're able to clean up, and then I go back to the side lane. Now, Dragon's about to come up, and I know this guy was recalling in this um, brush, so I ping it, Lux ults, and I'm able to kind of chill, use my W reactively to peel back. Beautiful. Zonya's the E2. Excellent. Pretty straightforward. Excellent. Now, Insta Reset. Preparation for the dragon. I have, I'm timing the 80 carry flash. Very important. When you're versing any mobile champion, you really want to time their flash because it changes directly the way fights are going to play out. I have ultimate. I don't have my Zonyas though. I remember actively thinking as I'm coming out of base, do I have ultimate? Tick. Do I have Zonyas? No, but I have sums. Where's my cane? My strong member. Where is he? Okay, interesting. He's walking to the rift hut, so I'm going to shadow my strong member. Then I see him trying to contest the rift. I think this cane didn't want them to get the rift. So I'm sitting off to the side. Now, I don't really want this fight. I'm valuing my own life really high, but I know that Silas can't be here yet, but I know that I don't have Zonyas. So if I'm going to go in, i got to make sure I'm one-shotting, getting in, getting out. Then cane goes in. I one-shot this in Zao, and then I don't continue this fight. We can't win this fight. I can't reset because there's too many of them and I don't have Zonyas, so I just back off. Notice if I was not aware of my Zonyas cool down there, I probably would have stayed in the fight and I probably would have died and given, given away my 10 stacks of Dark Seal. Same thing, constantly shadowing my strong members. Now, moving on, Silas goes for a little bit of a pick in the jungle, whatever, this is largely noise. And then I go to the side lane again. In between the plays, I'm going to the side, trying to catch farm, shove it out, reset, then shadow. That's the, that's the pattern, isn't it? Shove aside, reset, shadow. Then go to a side, shove a wave, reset, shadow. Rinse, repeat over and over again. Orienting myself around the objectives. Orienting myself around the win condition. Grab my blue buff. Kane's looking mid. So then what do I do? I look mid as well. I'm shattering off to the side. There's no way... My, I'd say this is somewhat multi-threat. Not really. I'm kind of coming in from a similar angle, but I thought this guy's mental stack was probably very overwhelmed. I'm able to get a nice little R onto this guy. Peel back quite nicely. Flash back into my team. I'm not rushing my R2 here because I don't, I don't really know who I can follow up on, right? So there's no point using my R if I can't follow up on anyone. If I can't actually continue to get my R off, just hold it. Wait. Be patient. They dive. I peel back with my fear. Then I wait again. Wait till someone's low. Wait for my cooldowns to come back up. Re-engage. Boom. It's all the same Vex fundamentals, isn't it? Trying to, trying to come in from the side. Going on the member that I know that I can actually kill and get the reset off of. Not casting my R2 when I know that I can't actively guarantee a kill. Peeling back when I don't have my abilities. Waiting until I know who I can kill. And then boom, re-engaging. Again, just classic, just classic Vex fundamentals. There's nothing really sexy here. It's all the same boring things is done reliably. That's what makes a very good Vex player. Moving on. We ping for the Baron, we end up getting the Baron. Same thing, what do I do? I shadow my team. I shadow what, what, what I think is gonna happen. Now, here, I thought that I could actually get the, uh, the R because he used his clone thing and I thought he was just gonna run forward, but he, he like goes the other way for some reason. So I missed that one, which is a bit of a blunder. So, man, I don't really regret using it. It looks like it's a pretty easy one. I don't really know. It's a weird movement from the Wukong, so whatever. Um, but I group up with my team. Ideally, I'd be sitting off to the side if I have R, but I don't have R, so I don't really feel that comfortable. But we're failing off to stop, so we're just going to siege mid. And at this point, the game's kind of over. Um, all I want to do is play around the next objective, making sure I'm always coming in from the side. If my team's kind of sitting off to one side, I'm going to be kind of coming in from the other angle. 
Kane goes in. Notice how I don't use my R here though. A, he has mobility. B, he has Zonyas. So I'm not using my R. Even when I have it available, I don't use it. I don't use it. Even when he doesn't have E, I still don't use it. I still don't use it. Waiting. Waiting. Because I really cannot afford to use it. Boom. I know Zinzo has limited mobility. Then I go in, get a high value fear, AoE, and then we just rinse them. Really simple. So this looked like, back then, a pretty tough game, didn't it? Especially when Silas cleaned up here. I mean, it was a close game here. It was 4 to six zero zero one. Blood in the water, snowball, boom, throw my lead, fed Silas, bot lane gets annihilated. Doesn't look like a free win, does it? But through good Vex fundamentals, like I explained to you, you're going to find a lot of opportunistic plays. This is the way I think about Vex heading into mid game. So this VOD, this is going to be the full game review. I absolutely love this game because I think it encapsulates like from start to finish nearly every single Vex fundamental. But the main one, that I haven't, the other ones didn't really cover, is playing around and identifying a win condition. This game, I knew that we weren't gonna scale to win this game. We had to like play balls to the wall, we had to create a win con, we had to dive aside, we had to really snowball. If the game got stalled out, especially with the luck stalling out the game, and a failure zone, I'm sure many of you right now are experiencing the Enchanter meta, it's not gonna look good. And um, this game really, I think, encapsulates the strength of DMATs. It encapsulates the, the importance of playing really hardcore around a win condition and um, really playing around your teammate's location. So let's dive in. Now, you know, there are many, and I think my, yeah, my team actually died level one. Um, they got double killed, which uh, wasn't optimal. So level one, Usually, I would start Q in this matchup and just shove and use my offense as defense, but I think I started level 1 for the invade, but we end up getting just killed, so it didn't do anything. Um, my my hypothesis here was I'm going to use my offense as defense. I'm going to stand outside the wave, and notice how I'm walking back and forth trying to get into range to use a Q, so I can get like a, uh, a, a E auto attack there, end up getting double auto attack, but not proccing my Electro. I'm happy to heavy trade because she has Dorans and I have Seapot. Now, I also know that the enemy jungle doesn't have much threat. It's a Mundo jungle, so I can posture up very aggressively. I'm trying to get my level 2 first. Now, I end up getting nailed by a few Qs, which is not optimal. And I know that I, I just want to push the pace of the game. I don't want to receive ganks. I want at least to gank sides, and then so I can facilitate another win con. I don't want to get myself fed. I want someone else to be fed so that I can actually facilitate that win condition. Now, I thought I was in range for E to go for a max range EQ knowing that I probably wasn't going to be able to use it for a while because I'd already shoved the wave in, but um, end up getting tethered and spaced by the Lux. Now, I um, end up getting a nice little bit of vision here. I end up trying to steal the um, steal the Raptors. Doesn't work out too well. Same thing. I just want to continue to push the pace of the lane. Even at the expense of a little bit of HP, I want to maintain Pryo, which will give me the ability to potentially you know, back up the Elise if an opportunity presents itself, because I know this Elise was going to play very aggressive. This isn't the best way to play the isolated 1v1. Um, if I were to play the isolated 1v1, I would want to keep this wave state. I want to keep neutral state somewhat in the middle, which gives me a little bit more freedom, a little bit more flexibility. Now, Lux looks to be hovering bot. It looks like this Elise is camping bot. I ping back to the best of my ability. And um, I end up holding it, end up chilling for a little bit. End up chilling. Wave is now coming back onto my side. End up avoiding that E quite nicely. Getting a nice little short trade with the EQ. Wait, did I even proc that EQ? I, th I think I did. I ping mid. Uh, looks like at this time I must have been trying to set up a gank. But looks like the wave ends up crashing. I have DMAT, so I'm able to shove into a reset. So pretty slow early lane, um, pretty chaotic game as well. I think my top lane has actually died. If we take a look at the scoreboard in a second. Uh, yeah, my, sorry, my top's died twice. Bot lane is very back and forth. My jungle has already died twice. So the game is looking pretty grim. And I remember I was thinking at this stage, um, I'm probably not gonna be able to kill Lux. Um, she has cleanse. It's just hard. She has she's too high range. So I remember thinking here, I gotta I gotta make something happen through bot. It's not gonna be top. My Riven's already behind. I need to create a winning side. So I come back, instantaneously shove the wave, make Lux react to the wave, insta hover. Again, blood in the water. There's something happening. Bot looks like they're getting annihilated. Um, I try to hover. Um, 
They get Dove, which isn't good. They're getting zoned from a metric ton of farm. This one was really rough. I tried to peel my AD carry a little bit. We end up getting a kill. Um, but Lux comes. But the, it's okay in the sense that it's good for me in the 1v1 mid because Lux ends up ditching a lot of farm. But my Akshan gets annihilated because Akshan misses so much farm from this. So I remember thinking, still, I know Riven isn't going to be the win con here. It has to be bought. I know it has to be bought. So luckily, Elise comes straight back bought, helps the Akshan get a little bit of farm. Now that my ultimate's about to come up, look what I do. Luckily, Lux overstays and dies. So I insta-shove. Dmat the next cannon. Shove. Again, same thing. Hover. Shove, hover. Shove, hover. Same side. Boom. Felios walks up. Boom, I rush my second R, which is an absolute cardinal sin. Talk, coming back to one of the biggest mistakes. I do that there, unfortunately. Oh, no, I don't. That was my E, sorry. That was, I think that was, wasn't my Q. That was my Q. Um, so I end up getting the next one. Not too bad. Now, I know definitively that my bot tide is my win con. So my entire reference point, everything that I'm thinking about this game, it's all about not interacting with the Lux, trying to help my bot lane and, and, and facilitate this Elise ganking bot. My top died again and lost a lot of farm. I stay for a little bit longer here. I take a nice little short trade, a high value EQ. It looks like this Lux was looking at bot lane right now because they end up dying. I get end up getting nailed, but that's okay. Shove one more, reset, lost chapter. Boom, same thing. Come back, DMAT, shove, EQ, not interact with the Lux, forcing Lux to ult the wave as well. Same thing. Ping on my way bot. Sweep, hover. Now Lux is going to be scared to follow. If Lux follows, we can turn onto the Lux. Sweep, clear a bit of vision. We know 100% that the map split because Mundo just got the rift. So I ping on my way here, trying to go for a play onto the Lux, but she sees me with the Scryer's Bloom. And I'm trying to make sure that they deny the farm. I really don't want this Ophelios and Sona to get the farm. So now we're zoning them just by hovering. So then it looks like they're well and truly zoned. So I go back mid, trying to balance farm with uh, helping my bot lane. So I try to clear the way from max range. Mundo try and chases me out. Now, chilling, bot lane ends up getting that double kill, which is excellent. Riven ends up killing Lux on the back end. Now the game is starting to become very clear to me. Wow, we've actually really turned around this bot lane. The hovers, the roams, it's really helped this bot lane. Still not gonna be an easy game, but I, I mean, I, at least I know where to direct my attention. I'm like, okay, Lux, I think is moving bot maybe. So what do I do? I move bot again. They're camping. I follow just in case Mundo or Lux comes. I just peel back. Reset with my team. Lane assignments are going to get swapped up. Dragons coming up in 50 seconds. So I want to go bot ideally and tell the Samira to go mid. So they go mid. Excellent. Now we end up, I end up catching bot wave. Because I really want to like come in from the flank. Like all I'm thinking is I'm just going to catch this wave and then I can sit off to the side. And if they contest dragon, I can come in from the side. That's all I'm thinking. But at least ends up trying to play around me. I didn't. I didn't actually see if this guy had no flash or not. And then when he pinged it, I'm like, oh shit, he actually has no flash. So that's why I was kind of conservative with my R. Um, and then I end up using it, and then we end up one shotting essentially. So the reason I was hesitant at the start was that I didn't know he had flash, and I really, really didn't want to miss my R here. If I knew it didn't have flash, I probably would have R'd like here or something like that. Because I think at that range, I could probably hit it or even here. Um, end up getting it off anyway, so it doesn't matter. So I shove that wave in, reset, swap the lane assignments. I tell Riven to go bot. Same thing. If I see something happen, I'm going to hover. I hover, but the play was over. I didn't have R, so I couldn't really do much. Shove. If I don't have R and I'm not immediately hovering, I'm catching a side wave. So what do I do? I shove, I shove, I shove, because nothing's happening mid and Samira died, so there's nothing for me to hover to. So the only thing I can do is catch waves in the side. Then I see Jax is over actually overextended, and I know he actually has a big shutdown. Um, so I end up just hovering again, coming from the side. Waiting for Jax to use the Q. I don't use it yet. I don't use it yet. Then I use it. Fear. Boom, peel back a little bit. Excellent. So notice here, I could have used R here, but then likely potentially could have missed it. I walk up, get the, the uh, melee range fear into an R. Boom. Big shutdown. Okay. 
Now, wing cons. Sure, I'm a secondary wing con, but this is the main wing con. I cannot carry into this team. I need other people fed to help me. So again, continually focusing on that Samira. Shadow mid temporarily because I can't really go top. And I ping assistance top from the, the Elise. Pinging that Rift is, is going to be up. Jack shows top. I can't really deal with him. So what do I do? Shadow mid again. Coming from the side. Shadow. Spot out the Mundo. Hovering over the walls. Hovering with Sweeper. Catching waves only when I think nothing's going to happen mid. Because I saw Elise catching farming camps on bot side. So I have time to farm this, this, this top camps as well. Then I see Elise kind of hovering mid. So I also want to do the same. Hover from the side. Multi-threat, potentially, if they engage, I'm going to be able to come in from the side. Hovering out of vision. Trying to make sure they don't spot me. Knowing that dragon's the next objective, this is our third dragon. Hovering out of vision. Hovering out of vision. Hovering out of vision. Trying to put myself in a nice little position because I know if dragon's the next objective, they're going to come this way. Me and Elise have the same idea. We camp in the jungle, waiting for someone to come so we can one-shot. I ping the stopwatch. Notice, it, look at this. I'm looking for the stopwatches. That's when I press tab. I'm looking for... I'm looking for MR, but more important, looking for mobility, gale forces, but I'm also looking for stopwatches. Boom, we're very patient. I know we really need this dragon, this wing con, it's really important for our wing con here. Boom, and we end up killing the, uh, the Mundo here slowly. I was worried that we weren't gonna kill here. I think we end up, yeah, we end up getting the kill. Sona compensates, and we end up getting another little kill here. But the premise is still the same. Getting, thinking about where they're going to head into, trying to bait or trying to make a pick before the play or around our wing con, same thing. This allows us to secure the third dragon, which is our huge other wing con outside of the Samira, which is dragons. Same thing, in between the plays, if I don't immediately have R and need to be hovering my team and looking for a play, what am I doing? Shoving a side wave, shoving a side wave. Boom, now I get Magi's, I've got my stopwatch. Hovering mid again. Hover, hover, hover. Jax jumps onto me. I actually got caught off by Jax here. I didn't think Jax would be moving down like this. Um, so I end up peeling back with my W. I still have stopwatch, I was trying to hold onto it and bait him in a little bit. Bait him in, excellent. Okay, now that's 12 stacks of Magi's, same thing. I still have my ultimate available. I know nothing's happening right now because Samira was, I thought she was actually resetting and then I can't hover mid again. Hover, 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 peel, boom. Okay, pretty straightforward. So moving on a little bit, the game is now starting to get, you know, mature. Um, Cloud Drake's coming up in two minutes, still trying to shove and move, same thing. Hovering out of vision, sweeping, putting myself into a good location. Then... Getting to the objective nice and early, waiting for someone to get go for a little bit of vision, one shot, boom. That is why I love the Luden setup. I feel like I can just assassinate people like this. I feel like when I don't have Ludens, I just can't do this sort of thing. Um, so that's just preference. And I ping straight for the Baron. I know they can't contest this. Peel them off the Baron. They end up trying to fight us. And I know I really, really, really want the Dragon, but they end up fighting us here so we're able to take them out. Um, I get caught up in rotation, that's completely fine. Moving on to the key learnings here. Got my Zonyas, have my Med's Eyes, shove the side. Um, they end up going for a dive that I wasn't there. Now this is actually really, really interesting. Um, so I thought that I could have shoved and then moved. I thought that was enough, but what I didn't factor in was that Jax was annihilating the Riven, so I actually had to help the Riven. Either two things had to happen here. We can't play three lanes. We have to play two. Either it's a 4-1 and then we kind of dive the mid immediately in, in order to out-pressure the jacks seal, or I have to like help the Riven. But what happens, I play the third the third lane. They're feeling really pressured to make a play mid because Jax is going to be on our inhib soon. They dive and then they get collapsed and I'm not here. And then the AD carry actually says, we need you here. And it's, we should have only played two lanes. I'm like, yeah, that's actually really, it's a really good point. So then I adapt the way I play the team fights thinking, holy shit, Jax can actually dive our Samira and actually ruin our wing con. So look actually how I alter the way I play. Instead of shoving and moving, look what I do here. I actually group and I sit on top of my Samira knowing she's the wing con. Look at this. This is not how I played the entire game. I actually shifted the way I played team fights based off my role. I knew now my role was to sit on top of the Samira. Then Aphelios is rage splitting. We end up getting a nice little pick. The game stalls out a little bit more. And in the last fight, look what I'm doing. Grouping up, 
making sure I'm hyper aware of my Samira's location. I know he's not here to peel back, peel back, peel back. I know Jack's a TPing in, CC, front to back, kill the front and the first member. And then this way, this is how we play the fires. This allows Samira to pop off and then we just win the game. A nice little adaptation there in terms of um, win con assessment. So this is what I believe, you know, great Vex quality gameplay is. It's not about solo killing your opponent. It's not about looking for anything in the 1v1. It's about identifying win conditions, hovering out of vision, coming from, you know, generating multi-threat. That's what it's all about. Okay, hopefully you're starting to see the trends in both the mid-game and the Silas game and this game, how I approach actually killing the next and how I think about the game. Okay. Hey, look here. So what rank is this one at, by the way? Uh, I'm in plat one now. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm... Uh, memoir is a bit higher. Okay. Um, we've got a Vex said, why, why this VOD in particular? What are we looking for here, man? Uh, I've been uh, playing a lot of Vex recently. Mm -hmm. and Yeah, since last time, I've been trying to focus on my ultis. And, okay. uh, and what was the last yeah. learning objective we had? Yeah, focusing on the ultimates. And is that been was, working uh, well for you? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Nice. Um, and uh, yeah, just being more uh, patient with them. And uh, yeah, I, I haven't been able to play that much actually because I I had uh, COVID as well. So. Oh wow, Did you recover okay now? Yeah, it was fine. It was just like a couple of days. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it set me back. In uh, yeah, I play play my placements with uh, COVID, so oh, kind no. of sucked. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not easy. It's not easy. Okay. So what was your hypothesis here? How did you want to play this one out? Uh, yeah, it was a bit rough start because I had to go back right before. But uh, yeah, right now I just want to uh, slow build uh, a couple of waves. Okay. And uh, yeah, try to poke him. Okay. Zed missed his first WQ, which is very nice. This gives us a lot of proactivity. Sure, if I could have, uh, yeah, hmm. been more aggressive. One thing I, that you could have done here is that you could be, I think you could be positioned up behind this one here. Well, two reasons. One, he'd already used, he'd already used his Q. I mean, even here, I think you could be pushing up more aggressive before he even queued here. Like, use the minions as defense. Even if you get clipped by a, a Q and you're behind a minion, it's not really going to do much damage. And he actually doesn't have his W because he just used it before. So I think there's a window here where you could be fishing a little bit more aggressively for an EQ. Yeah. See that? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so the Zed is definitely rushing his WQs, which is, is a good sign for you. Looks like Kha'Zix has done a bot to top as well from the looks of things. Yeah. We got a nice little slow build going on here. Fiora kills top. That's nice. Let's take a look at this one. By the way, don't be afraid to like, when you've already used your fear, don't be afraid to just fish for cues occasionally, you know, without the fear. Like, it can be completely fine. Um, and I'm not really a big fan of this one because your fear is about to come up. So what I would rather you do right now is use this as a little bit of an opportunity to maybe ward on top side, camp behind one of these minions, or even in the middle of the lane, and then wait for your fear to come up. Because you want your fear to be up as the wave is about to crash here. And now you actually give yeah. them access to the wave because you use your EQ before you had fear available. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not very good at tracking when my fear is about mm -hmm. to come up. That's, yeah, so that needs to be really... That, that, that should direct most of your decisions in the early lane. And, and I'm not a big fan of this because see, again, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of little things here, isn't there? I mean, you use your EQ before your fear was up. You also didn't ward as the wave was slow building such that when the wave crashed, look what you're doing. You're all the way back here. You should have already had a ward and you'd be walking up here fishing under tower. But because you didn't ward, now you're feeling scared to walk up. You're feeling like you have to ward, and now you can't utilize this built wave. Yeah. 
So yeah, this guy is really, really uh, rushing his abilities. Now in this situation, take a look what he does. He, he actually goes WW, so he goes right next to you. So what do you, what should you do here? Uh, fear. With specifically uh, ability. Yeah. yeah, W. W, right? Because then you, you're going to proc your fear, you're going to proc the passive, um, yeah. and then you can just do a nice little short trade and then back off. Yeah, I guess I nice wasn't really step. expecting him to go in. Okay, so not too bad. I mean, your 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 leaning was correct here. Um, I do like your, and I love this nice, nice little side step there on the Kazix W. And I like that you turn around for the passive passive auto as well. So nice, not too bad. Oh, very close. Oh, nice. Okay, the ignite. You get the ignite off. Well done. Yeah, okay. just barely. You're off to a pretty good start. So look, a few little minor details around ability usage. I feel like you could have used them a little bit more, your abilities more frequently. I think you could have timed your abilities better with your fear. Um, so not, not, not amazing, but not terrible. Okay. Now you're in a very good spot here. Um, Zed come back not with lethality yet. So you're in a good spot. doesn't have Dirk. So do you remember what was going through your mind here? Um... I just want to thin this wave a little bit uh, and slow build again. So one thing, one thing here, man, um, when I play Vex, I mean, sure, if I can slow build, I will. But a lot of the time, you know, I'm focusing a lot of my attention on simply, um, yeah, just on simply trying to trade onto them. Like, I mean, wave states are good, right? But I think that, Vex is even happy with neutral state, you know, Vex can work a lot with even neutral state. So I don't really have anything wrong with you slow building here, as long as you're posturing aggressively and fishing for, fishing for trades. Um, here as well, because your fear is so close to being up, I wouldn't use EQ. What I would do is if you want to use an ability, I would probably fish for Q only. Like I'll just fish for a Q. Cause I want this, I want this E to be up as soon as my fear is available. Yeah, right. Does that make sense? sense? Yeah. Because it has a pretty long cooldown. Yeah. Okay, so unfortunately, Mr. Cannon, wave is slow building out here. Now, one thing that I've noticed here as well um, with, with, with your Vex, so it looks like, okay, if you actually take a look at this, What you want to do with Vex a lot of the time is you want to get up into range and then you want to click back and forth. But with you, it kind of feels like you're either not, it's like, it's, how do I view it? Imagine it's a light switch, right? Imagine you got a switch and if it's, if, if it goes to the left, it's on. And if it goes to the right, it's off. This is how your ability usage is. You're either definitely putting it on or using it or definitely turning it off, which represents not using it. When in reality, what it needs to be is that you're somewhere in here. There's actually like you're having the switch in the middle where it's like they don't, you don't really, you're not making your intention clear whether you're using it or whether you're not using it. Here with your movements, notice how it's too obvious. The, only, the first time you get in range, you're instantly using it, aren't you? See yeah. that? So ideally what I would do, I would actually posture aggressively, but my intention would never be to use it immediately. I'd walk up, click back and forth, and then overwhelm this guy's mental stack, then use it when he's a little bit confused. You see that? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That way you'll see a lot of an, an increase in the reliability of your, your, your E's. Because that, everything hinges on you landing that E. Okay, I was literally going to say this when I was watching this. You got to be a little bit scared here because Zed goes for a little bit of a trade onto you, and you don't have your fear available. So I'd, be, you know, I mean, he guess he didn't have many abilities, and you end up avoiding the uh, the shuriken. So if you're confident in your movement, sure. But that was a pretty risky play. But 
Ends up working yeah. out, and I like the way you de-aggro it here, allow uh, Trundle to take their tower aggro, so not too bad. Okay. So Would you say the ultimate was good? Yeah, I think it's fine. Purely because Trundle was there to tank for you, I think it's good. I mean, like, uh, was it, like, uh, for sure they would hit? Um, I think it would have been, yeah, I think at that range, and given that it's kind of hard for Zed to move this way because he's kind of up against the minion, I think it's basically going to hit at that range. I don't, I think it's hard for him. I mean, if we're talking about optimization, it probably would have been better for you to use it while he was feared. Yeah. But, but I think at that range, you could safely assume that you would hit it because you can't really to the right anyway so i don't mind it all right um one other thing i will mention here um in, in, see here you can actually use your w to mitigate damage right here like just w yeah like there's no need to hold on to it I mean, unless, you know, unless you're, you're struggling for mana, but you don't really, that's not really the case here. All right. Okay. So moving on a little bit. What was going through your mind here? Yeah, I saw Pike was coming, so yeah. I thought I would be able to hit my abilities, but uh, yeah, it works out even though I missed everything. So this one's a tough one, right? I mean, because uh, you know what we were talking about before the on and off switch, right? Yeah. yeah. Notice how like when you walk up, like you've made it very obvious. Like the first time you're in range, you kind of go in. So I think you could have maybe like gone up and like faked it a little bit more here, but you know... I don't know how, it's hard for me to articulate this, but when you look at Zed's movement, imagine when you look at Zed right now, he's actually purely focusing on dodging, isn't he? Like he's not actually, see how he's not actually doing anything? Like he's not actually thinking about using his abilities on the way, like just the way he's moving. He's, he's purely focused on baiting out your ability. Can you see that? Yeah. So like you gotta be very careful in these situations and that's where you can actually overwhelm their mental stack the most. Because you know that they're purely thinking about avoiding your ability. So if you held it for probably another half a second, or even a second, it probably would have been completely fine. So not too bad. Pike comes in. And gets a little bit of a kill. We shove this one out. Not much we can do because we don't actually have our R available yet. So we just go for another quick reset. Okay. So this is where it's good to start thinking about secondary win conditions and who you really want to be playing around. You know, Zed's died quite a few times. He's 0-3. You want to start thinking about who is your, who's the person that you think that you can influence. To be honest with you, I think both, both of these side lanes have options, don't they? Top's heavy trading, and I wouldn't say that lane is over. Bot lane is a lot of gank setup with the pike and is pretty open-ended. So you've got, I think you've got a lot of options this game, don't you? Yeah, I think uh, a bit further on, uh, Trundle becomes really fed. And, right. Yeah, I just want to start following him. Okay, so Trundle ends up going bot here, and we end up hovering bot a little bit. Um. Okay, ping, good pings. Nice little, nice little poke. So, one thing that I'm going to be talking about in my Vex guide is how like my mindset shifts a lot when I play Vex in the sense like my overarching strategy. So for the first, like, say, eight levels-ish, eight to nine levels, I'm predominantly playing for lane. Like, whether I'm kind of farming, whether I'm looking for trades, whether I'm looking for solo kills. Once I get, like, to, you know, here, you know, your four-ish points in your queue, you've got your lost chapter, this is what I start to do. I start to just EQ the wave a lot of the time. And then I start to just go to sides. So here... This is actually exactly what I would do. I would EQ this. I mean, what I would, probably would have done. As soon as I get back here, I would e like EQ this. I mean, you don't have E available, but farm it. Um, shove it out as fast as you can. And then start hovering in side lanes. Start shadowing side lanes. Looking for plays. The analogy I'm going to use in my Vex guide as well is like, I'm like a... You've you got to view yourself as like a, 
like a shark that smells blood in the water. Like if you see that there's potential heavy trading topside or something could potentially happen top, especially when there's people that are injured in heavy trading, like I want to just hover there. I want to be around that area. I want to sniff it out, see what I can do. So Fiora ends up basing, so I guess there's not really much you can do there, but she ends up TPing top. So as soon as I see that TP, like I'm instantly, you know, I want to suss it out. So beautiful, I would shove this and I would instantly just hover top or at least be panning my camera top to see what the hell's going on up there. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Beautiful. And so I think you do it here just a little bit slow, but this is great. This is exactly what you're, this is exactly what you're looking for. You're smelling blood in the water. There's heavy trading, there's action. And this is where you can start to do cleanup duty. Nice. So this is an interesting one. I think I would have left Trundle to kill this guy. And I think I would have cleaned up this guy first. And then I probably would have helped the Trundle. Because he, because Kha'Zix jumped in, right? Like Kha'Zix was dead. <laughs> Surely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, think... I just thought that we could uh, kill him quickly and get a, ba a better angle for my other ultimate. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, but either way, see how the mind, the mindset is pretty good, but it, it notice how it could have been faster, right? Like just by obsessing the situation before him through camera panning. Yeah. I think that I thought that Fiora was kind of far behind because she had died right. twice, I think. Right. So I, I wasn't really looking top lane, but then yeah. I saw that they were, yeah, overextending. But not too bad. I mean, I really like, um, I really like the move. <clears throat> okay, moving on a little bit. We've now got our Everfrost and Sorks. Um, look, you've you've obviously opted in for the Everfrost setup, which, you know, it's completely fine this game. I, I'm personally more of a Ludens uh, Vex player, and especially since I'm the sole AP in this game, I would, and everyone's so squishy, I would love Ludens, but that's just preference. So here, what do we see? I mean, Trundle's killing it, isn't he? Trundle's killing it. Bot lane's still doing okay i mean since that they got ganked before and got a few assists they're doing okay um and again a lot of gang setup i think top is quite salvageable i think fiora is de you know definitively behind but salvageable i still think that you have a lot of options this is one of those games where i love playing as vex because you don't have to play on just one side of the map you've got so many people on your team that you could actively play around so again same thing i'd be scanning the side lands. I'd probably be panning my camera bot right now, um, looking for a potential opportunity. Um, like just, just gaining information. Cause you don't have alt now, so it's kind of hard for you to make a play, but just gaining information. Nice. Nice. Nice little opportunistic move. Bot land is heavy trading. We see that Zed is likely diving bot. So we should probably start panning our camera at least. Okay. Okay, this is again another very interesting situation. All right. So, plays over bot. Not really too much you can do mid. We know that Aatrox is dead for another five seconds. Fiora is shoving out topside. A very creative play. There's two things that you could either be doing right now. You could just walk bot and try to like maybe invade this jungle and like, you know, take their camps and like hover the trundle while he does something bot side, take that blue, whatever. Alternatively, another creative play you can actually make right now, even though Dragon's kind of somewhat coming up soon, is you could actually walk over here and you could actually sit here or here. As soon as Aatrox comes out, Fiora's gonna be here, they're gonna meet, whether whether the timing's Fiora is either there or you're here or whether the way is here and you're here, it doesn't matter. I'm pretty sure between your spike right now and you you have everything, you can kill 100 to 0. Now, the only risk of that play is that Dragon is coming up and Trundle potentially is going to invade right now. But that's the way I'm starting to think. I'm starting to look for unique opportunities because I don't want to interact with the Zed anymore. I just want to shove and move. This actually ties into something that I should have mentioned is that you should also have Sweeper by now. When you're ahead like this and you're not really feeling that threatened, you should have sweep up because it's going to keep those options. It's going to give you more options. Does that make sense? Those potential plays there? Yeah. So notice how... Uh, yeah. 
I'm trying to be a scavenger. And, you know, I'm again, that shark in the water. I'm looking for these opportunistic plays. And again, no need to interact with the Zed right now. You should be getting priority, shoving the wave, and moving. And I'm 90% sure if you went top, it would have worked. And you see the heavy trading straight away, but not too bad. Our team is on bot side here, hiding out of vision. Hmm. I think this was... I, I like the play. I think that you should have ulted though. So here, I think... Can't you just flash a boo in the Everfrost in tilt? Uh, you can. It's really broken. Yeah, yeah I can see maybe. that. I can see that, yeah. Because then Pike can follow up with a hook and then he's just one shot. Alternatively, what you could have also done, this is fine you have everfrost so then what you can do is you can e you got the fear then you are grant vision and then you can just chain cc fear into everfrost into pike and then he's just dead so any of these plays work you just had to r there i feel like flashing is just better because if you win this fight you win the game yeah i can see that i just i don't i mean I just don't think it's necessary, but yeah, you can you can flash and we'll guarantee the play, yeah. And, it, it, and if you win this, it is probably just game over, yeah. So the things that were good about this is your positioning, right? You're behind the wall, you're out of vision, and they're coming in, you know, you're trying to bait them in. Um, but it, it looks like a little bit of hesitation here, maybe because you thought that you, maybe you didn't anticipate that you would land the E or, or something like that. But yeah, actually looking at it again, flash W would be nice because you have so much backup here and that would guarantee the 100 to zero. And then you kill their jungler, you could probably even re-engage re -engage onto the Jinx or just secure the dragon. It'd be a, you know, a really, really high value play. All right. So the play gets extended. Here we go. This is a play and a half. Excellent, pretty straightforward. That guy's really squishy and you're very strong. Pretty straightforward, well done. Nice little reset angle, excellent. Now, do you remember what you were thinking like at this point in time? What was your thought process? Like what was the wing con here in your mind? I just wanted to uh play with Trundle okay. uh, because he was really strong and this is uh, yeah kind of one thing I've noticed is that your camera panning is, is, is off like there's no reason not to look at the play like I don't know you don't know what's happening here do you <laughs> right like this entire time think about how many seconds so we we pan our camera at 1433 four Five, six, seven, eight. So that's five seconds of not knowing how that play is even happening. What's going on? Yeah. See, see what I mean? And this, this bit you in the ass because you're you're assuming that the play is gonna it's gonna stay like this. We don't know what's happening. Um, now it is a little bit unfortunate that Kazix is here. Um. You know, with the beauty of hindsight, we probably just, if we actually panned Can't our camera... Can't you just one-shot Kha'Zix? I don't... Don't you one-shot Kha'Zix? I don't I think uh, you do. It, without, without... Maybe oh, I... Nah, 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 no way. Any oh, yeah, you, uh, you don't have ult. Yeah, I thought you had here, though. So, yeah, I think a little bit of a camera panning issue. If we saw Kha'Zix, we could have probably got to disengage with the portal, but it is what it is. So, uh, unfortunately, that's a big swing in the game. Your bot lane actually died. Trundle is going to be a big win con for you. But unfortunately, you know, your bot lane died and your top lane struggling. So not going to be easy. So right now, still, your focus is predominantly playing with the, the Trundle, correct? Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at this. Pike comes in. Can't go for the one shot, unfortunately. Whoa. Okay. Hmm, interesting. 
Did was it here that you just didn't think you could one shot? Is that why you didn't R here? Yeah, mm. I uh, yeah, I was a bit unsure. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Um, a few little details here. Um, when it comes to the fear here, what you probably want to do is you want to uh, you want to e behind them so then they kind of walk into you. That's another thing as well. But I don't know if think that would have even mattered because I think you, you know, Everfrost held them in place, but I'm not 100% sure. The problem with this one is two things. One, you don't have fear when you're, uh, when you're R-ing in and you also don't have many abilities. You only have your Q. So this is like, I, I really dislike doing this because it feels really hard. Like it feels really like if I'm going in there, I'm, I'm like exposing myself completely. The only reason I don't mind it though is because you do have access to stopwatch. I think if you got that kill and then insta stopwatch here without taking as much damage, I think your pike probably would have been able to back you up. I don't know if you would have survived either way, but I'm just not a fan of this ult like in general. I feel like what I would have done here is I would have went more onto the Aatrox, if anything, because Lulu is way too far. Like look how far away you are from your team. Um, and you could also just hover that Lulu, and then they have to make a choice. Like, if you ult here, but you don't click it. Yeah, you don't click it. Either they, they all run away. Yeah. Agreed. And if they don't, you can just kill later. Yeah, agreed. Classics basically has to bodyguard Lulu then. Yeah. But the premise here, and the one thing that I'd be looking for moving forward, is as long as you're aware of the situation that you're, like, you're throwing yourself into, as long as you're aware of the fear, your cooldowns, the lack of ignite, that sort of thing, as long as you're aware of that, then, you know, I have no issue. Now, just like, a, just something to keep in mind, you know, I talk, and I'm going to talk a bit about this in the guide, but like Ludens versus Everfrost, you know, they have strengths. They both have strengths and weaknesses, but like, this is a perfect scenario of where like, I feel as though Ludens, like it just guarantees situations like this, where you can just play for the one shot. Like, I, I, I don't know, like, especially when you're the sole AP like this and you're fed, it just feels so much better in my opinion to have Ludens because these sorts of players, they just work. Like you have a clear identity. It's like, I'm going in, Getting the one shot, we've got a burst, like, Pike can follow me up with the burst. Like, it's going to work nearly, mo like, most of the time. It's a squishy. So, I feel as though when you have Everfrost, you, you can't play like this. It, when, you're pl when you're playing with Everfrost, you need to be more, like, you have less burst. You need to be playing more conservative with the team. Playing more to create space for other members. But here, your team wasn't really in position. So, this isn't completely coherent with Everfrost Vex. Um... But anyway, small little details. If you stop watch earlier, maybe you would have had enough HP to kill the Aatrox. Small little details. Does that make all make sense? Like, in terms yeah. of why it might Yeah, be. I knew it was uh, kind of risky to go in, uh, but gotcha. I'm, not, I'm not really sure why yeah. I, I went in. So that's okay. That will come with time. We can we can address that. Yeah. Um. So moving on a little bit, we're starting to and right now, you, I'm assuming he just kind of wanted to shove and move. Or something, or did you want to get hopper? What was the thought process here? No, I wanted to, uh, yeah, shove and move. Yeah, that's exactly what I'd do. I'd what I'd be doing the same thing shoving, moving. I would be probably moving around here, hovering the team just in case something happens around mid. Like, imagine if you're hovering trundle here, man. See what I mean? Yeah, but you're not, and then, uh. You miss potential play. I mean, that could have been a hundred to zero potentially on that Kha'Zix. But we don't have R yet, so it's going to make things a bit tricky. Jinx was split there, but I don't know if she has Gale Force or not. So it's hard. To, if she has Gale Force, you probably can't go for this R. That was a bit hesitant because Pike mm. was still on the way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we kind of get our fear baited out a little bit, but it looks like he just gets one tapped anyway. Not too bad. I like your positioning around the next objective here. This is nice. Getting to the objective nice and early, hovering around the edges, fishing for plays. Here we go. Nice. Nice, well done. Really, really nice. Okay. This should secure the next dragon, theoretically. Um, good, good, good. 
sit around the area. Excellent. We've now got Zonias, which is going to make your life much easier. And now it's just a matter of rinse repeat, isn't it? Shove side, get Fura matching the, the Aatrox, and then look for picks. There's a few things you can do, right? In this situation, what I'd be doing is I'd be telling Fura to go bot. Then at that point, I'd be going top. I'd be, I mean, and you got to, I mean, to make things easier for yourself, probably call it in advance, but in a perfect world, you'd be the one catching top wave here, shoving this one out, then doing either one or two things. You could then hover around mid, just kind of sitting around the areas, you know, using your sweeper. If you felt safe and they were hovering, your team was hovering you, maybe you could have swept over here or just fish around here, sweep, camp bushes, sweep, whatever, and then fishing for opportunistic plays. If you felt as though the enemy was really hard to pick um, and you felt as though like there was just not really much happening, another creative play that can be made in a situation like this is where you, you actually shove it out and then you hover your Fiora and then you lane gank and kill the Aatrox with the Fiora. That's a very common play that I make with with Vex that is really effective, um, but that would only be the that would only be valuable if you feel so nothing can happen here, obviously, because making a play topside would probably benefit your team because you know she has the TP advantage, um, something to keep in mind. But I think a few a key variable here that I forgot to actually mention is that it's Kraken Slayer, not Gale Force. When you see Gale Force eighty carries, it actually changes the amount of threat that you impose big time. So it actually is a very important variable to consider. Does that all make sense? Yeah, yeah. But notice how that all ties uh, yeah. into the same underlying reference point, doesn't it? It's like, I am this, you know, I'm this shark. I want to look for opportunistic plays. And this just feels really bad because everyone knows where you are and you can't really beat the Aatrox. I mean, you can't really do too much in the, in the 1v1 here. Everyone's coming to you rather than you hovering the enemy team. This just feels really awful. Um, so... This is big. This is really, really big. This is not how Vex wants to navigate the mid game. But we eventually hover. This is excellent. I'm glad that you don't R here because we don't know if he has, she has flash or not. She's not CC'd. So this is really, really good that you don't R there. Well done. Good hold. Good hold. We can't go yet. Can't go yet. Are there mental stacks overwhelmed? Boom. So I don't mind this one because again, mental stacks are overwhelmed. The only, the only iffy thing about this one is that the the threat is coming from this way. So your R is kind of like foreseeable in a way. Like ideally you're kind of coming from an angle, but here just because of the way it's played out, you can't really, you don't have the luxury of that. But the reason I don't mind it is because Jinx looks very tunneled in on the Jin and the Trundle there. So maybe, you know, maybe um, you could overwhelm, you know, maybe it's not too bad. But I'm, I'm really, really happy with the patience. That's much better than our last review, isn't it? I mean, the, I feel like yeah. the, the old you would have just, ah, oh, this Lulu, she would have flashed. And then, you know, you just, you just wish, miss your, oh, you're useless. So well done. Here as well, yeah, you I've could have ever frosted the Kha'Zix, I think, as well. But anyway. But well done. I can see the improvement. I can see the how your learning objective focus on improving that R usage has really paid dividends for you. That's uh, a good tier. So at this point, um, I'm assuming. What were you thinking? Do you remember what was going through your mind here? Uh, I can't remember exactly, oh. but uh, I yeah, Jinx was kind of scary with mm -hmm. Lulu, so I. Didn't really want to five v five. Okay. Um, I've uh, I don't really like team fighting with uh, Vex, especially with its if it's like five v five uh, front to back. Well, yeah, it just depends. I think with your comp, like you probably would want to utilize the fact that you have TP advantage or um or, or, or the fact that you have pick with Pike or that you have a stronger side lane than Zed right now. But anyway, Zed gets picked. Now this is very important. Your damage on Baron is very limited here. What I would recommend you do is I would recommend here while your team is doing, because they, they can do this forever, they can tank you. I would actually recommend altering your positioning a little bit. I would either go over here or I would actually even go here and like kill that pink. Or I would even like just start, just like just hovering, you know, out of vision, like essentially. Like you don't want to be coming in again linearly like this. I mean, I just think that it feels bad to kind of be all the way here. I think it'd be much better to be exerting threat from the side and making it hard for them to come in and getting ready for the turn. 
that's what I'd be looking like. I'm getting ready for the turn. Like, I don't want to start. I don't want to do. I don't want to just 50. I don't want a 50 50. So, like, that's why if I'm over here, again, it might be easier for me to land an R. Or if, even if I'm here or something, I can come in from the side and I can maybe land an R if they get too close or if they come through here and I'm over there. You kind of get a side angle. Like, the, the premise is, though, is that you want to try and find an angle where you can get onto them and then and start that fight. And see how, and we, we miss a little bit of an R window here onto the Jinx. That would have been a nice little R window there. See that? Yeah. Even though you don't have your Fury available, she will CC. So you could just 100 to 0 and you could change this here with your Everfrost. But you end up <laughs> getting the Lulu in the background, which ends up working. Nice little follow up one onto the Kazakh because he doesn't have, uh, doesn't have jump. Well done. Okay. Does that make sense? Like the way you should be thinking, like what I was describing here? Yeah, I've been struggling with, uh, yeah, like mm. positioning before team fights or objectives. Yeah, a, a really common one that I've been using is I, I like I like to let them come. Like if you feel as though they're gonna walk in, like I'll actually stand like over here even, and then and then when they come in, I'm just coming in immediately from the side. You just again the the, the underlying fundamentals of Vex's art doesn't change. You want to be coming from the side, out of vision, that sort of thing. You really want to be avoid. I mean, look, sometimes you can do these linear fights, but especially when your front to back isn't amazing, it'd just be better to come in from the side and create chaos. Yeah. Was there anything from the uh, rest of this that you wanted to look at? Uh, so now for the Vex community Q&A, the first one here is from Beastly Ninja. It's kind of like a double two questions. Knowing when you should and shouldn't use fear for lane trading combos and the differences in laning between the multiple play styles in engage with Crown and Zonyas, Artillery Controller with Everfrost, and Burst Assassin with Ludens. First thing I want to point out, let's answer the second part of the question. Um, I don't even think engage with Crown and Zonyas is even a thing. Um, the reason being is that it's overkill. It's too much durability. You already have more than enough durability with Everfrost and Zonyas. It's, it's way too overkill. Think about it. You already have the fear and the shield from the W as well as Everfrost, as well as Zonyas, it's too much. By the time you're just gonna have no threat otherwise, and you're, you're I'd rather simplify it and have, um, you know, a more facilitator peel slash, you know, space creation type interpretation of Vex with Everfrost or the burst assassin style with Ludens. Now, to keep in mind, something to keep in mind is that neither of these really change the way you play lane because the build path is very similar anyway. You're still going Sorks, you're still going Lost Chapter, so it doesn't actually really change the way you play trades. It only changes or alters the way you play the mid game and specifically whether you're sitting on the team and peeling like I did in the very last fight of the last VOD review I did, or um, you're coming in from the side and following up and being a secondary engage. That really alters, you know, that's what it really changes. It doesn't really change your lane phase. As for the first part of the question, you know, knowing when you shouldn't use and you shouldn't and should use fear and lane for trading combos, view it from an aspect of threat. If the person or the champion you're versing has a lot of threat, either because they're ahead of you, you've messed up and you're behind, or they just have a lot of gap closes and CC, something like a LeBlanc or an Ari, or they threaten you because the wave state is in a really dangerous position, you're probably going to have to be careful about using fear. Always tie it back to threat. Don't overcomplicate it. If they threaten you, you got to be careful. If they don't threaten you, you're pressing your core key and the waves in the middle. You can use fear however you want. It really depends on how much threat they have on you. If you're unsure and you don't really know if you can get away with it or not, use it and see what happens. You might use it and be like, oh, they can't kill me. I can just EQ and then back off and then I'm fine. Alternatively, you know, you might do it and then you're like, oh shit, my wave's actually in a bad spot now and now I'm in trouble and I can get chased down the long lane. Play around with it. Don't overcomplicate it. Threat, remember, is an is part of your intuition. Threat needs to come from the feel aspect of the game. Threat is not a like a prefrontal cortex logical thing you think about. Threat has to be eventually intuition and muscle memory. It has to be a feeling. So play around with it. It's, it's always tied to threat. Wave location, CC, how ahead you are. And if look, if you have a lot of wave clear, you're, you're very ahead and you have a lot of AP then it doesn't even matter because you're just going to one-shot the wave anyway. So something to keep in mind. Hopefully that answers your question. Next one from Dan Naylor. 
When you press R into an enemy, what's the best combination of inputs? Sometimes I go in with W first, then E, then Q, but if the opponent got behind me, I'll W, I'll sometimes miss a spell because I get feared in a direction that isn't the one I headed. Just wondering if it's better to immediately take a step back after the W first or something. Yeah, so <clears throat> I would say 95% of the time, you're going to be doing R into W. The reason being is that you want to get your fear down ASAP so they don't flash away from you. If you don't immediately input with W and you don't have your fear ready, what's going to happen is that they're going to flash and then you're not going to be in range of W or they're going to flash away and then your W is going to push them the other direction or you're going to try and E and they're going to flash that. It's going to be a disaster. So nearly every single time you're going to go R into W with your fear already primed. Um, it doesn't really, I mean, I, I don't really know what you mean exactly if they get behind you. Um, I think, I don't understand how you can miss a spell because you're, you're never, you're always only going to be inputting the spell after you know which way they move anyway. So this maybe says to me that you're buffering your abilities too fast. Like you're just, you're just spamming your keys. RWEQ instantaneously. You don't need to do that. Just relax. RW. Wait a split second, actually see which way they're going to get feared, then EQ. Um, the fear isn't very short. You have time to input the EQ, so don't don't stress too much. It seems to me maybe you're you're rushing your combos a little bit too much. Um, be quick. Uh, uh, one of my favorite quotes I got from, I think it's from um, from John Wooden. The, uh, he was the, the basketball coach, NCAA. He, um, he says, be quick, but don't hurry. That's what I would use. Be quick, but don't hurry. That's a nice little mindset there. Uh, Muhammad. Um, what's her learning curve like? What similar chance can you springboard from her if you've learned them? What's the solo queue journey like with her? Is she one trickable? Good question. Um, I would say her learning curve is very smooth. She's probably one of the easiest champs there to learn because it's a very simple kit. Hopefully I've made her reference points in the game very clear with this guide. Her spikes are very obvious. You know exactly what you need to be doing in the game. She's very ultimate reliant. So like, you, it's very easy to make decisions that are coherent with her identity comparatively to something like a Yone. <clears throat> I would say if you're good at Vex, you'd be good at other more um, calculated all-in champions. I would say there's, there's probably overlap between LeBlanc and Vex. There's probably overlap between Silas and Vex. Um... What else? Maybe even Ari and Vex. A lot of these like more battle mage type slash kind of assassin type champions flow on from her quite nicely. Um, alternatively, I think a lot of the fundamentals you learn with Vex probably also follow on to like a TF, probably a Galio, and even more traditional control mages like a Victor and things like that. I think you would probably also find the skill set flows on. Um, what's the Soul Key journey like with her? I don't really know how to answer that question. I think... Um, it's hopefully, I mean, I don't, I think it's too general of a question. I, I think I've I answered that in how to learn Vex slide. Hopefully that, that, that slide answers that one. And is she one trickable? Um, I, I would say below plat two. Yes, probably. Yes. You could probably one trick her, but I don't think you really want to do that because I think there are going to be some games where you're paired with junglers that have low threat comps with very limited engage. Um, and you're versing like a high range comp and you don't have any threat in your co in your team and you're going to get railed. Like you're versing like a Lux and like a, a Sona and like a Jinx and then you're paired with like a Nidalee and like a, like a Nah and then like, like just something like an Ezreal and you're like, you're just useless because you can't peel and you can't dive. You're just going to have no identity. So I would say there are some games where it could be really nasty. So I wouldn't recommend one tricking her. Next one. Nat, I noticed while playing Vex and Solo Queue, you have to keep track of your fear passive. I get ganked very easily as a wasted on the wave or trading. Is there a good way to survive a gank without the fear, or is there a strategy to make sure you have your passive ready? Same thing here. I don't really, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but holding fear versus using fear would be great to see. Look, <clears throat> I want you guys to think of it more in terms of threat. This is similar to how I answered the first question here. How much threat is getting imposed onto you? whether it's via the enemy jungler, whether it's via the laner that you're versing. You know, if you're versing a LeBlanc and a Rek'Sai, you're gonna have to be very careful and conservative with the way you use your fear, right? If you use your fear in the wave and you don't have appropriate vision down and your wave's cooked, then you're gonna be in trouble. Just view it very intuitively very, via common sense. But if you're versing a low threat mid laner and a low threat jungler, you can use whatever you want. 
But yes, if your wave is in a bad spot and you don't have vision down, you, you got to either ask your jungler to help, you got to either try and get vision down creatively so you can lean to one side, um, and then which in which case you can use your EQ and lean onto that one side, or or somehow bait them to use your abilities on your wave and let the wave come out to you. That's also possible. But yeah, when you don't have your fear available, and you, especially if you use your EQ on the wave, you're probably going to die a lot of the time versus these high threat champions. So you've got to be very careful. Um, again, it needs to be intuitively over time. So what I would, this is exactly the process I would recommend. Go to a moment in your review where you die or where you blow flash. Go to a, that, that exact moment, right? So let's call that X event. Go to that moment. Then what you should do, rewind over the past, just observe, and actually, no, before you even rewind, observe what happens as if you're like a scientist in the lab and you're observing some experiment. Observe what actually happens here. Be like, oh, interesting. Ah, interesting. I actually use my fear here, and because my wave's in this location, Jarvan was able to gank me. Or I didn't stand behind the wave, which meant that LeBlanc was able to hit me with chain. Whatever it might be, just observe what the hell happened, okay? Then go back, and after you've observed it, look at what the alternative reality could have been What if you actually employed a different cause of action. So maybe you didn't cue the wave before and the wave was in the neutral state instead of on their side, or you didn't use your, your fear and you held your fear and just relaxed and farmed till six. Actually look at what, try and envision, visualize what the alternative would have been and how you could have come to that conclusion. Maybe you could have seen you had no vision. Your jungler's in base and can't back you up. You're versing a high threat jungler. Of course, you're going to have to think about your fear. You know, these are the sorts of things you'll notice in your reviews. And over time, if you do this again and again and again, you'll slowly develop that intuition and develop a better threat assessment. Next one here from X Legend Hunter. Um, I'm confused about Vex's build path and play style. When I check LOL analytics, the most popular build path... Never have Zonya second, which seems like absolute insanity to me, considering her ult will often bring her into the enemy team during a team fight. When I follow the meta builds and go Shadow Flame or Horizon Focus second, I usually end up going one for 1.5 in early team fights, and this doesn't seem optimal. Your Masters last season. Okay, so yeah, you're spot on, man. I don't think that's the meta build. I very rarely go um, straight Mythic into Shadow Flame. Very, very rarely. Like I said, usually what I'm doing is I'm doing Mythic, and then I'm doing uh, Stopwatch, and then I'm deciding at this point whether I want to. I need to build my Stopwatch because I mean Zonius because I've already used it and it's a very fast paced high threat game, or I need to like engage, or I'm snowballing. They haven't burnt my Stopwatch. I'm killing it, and otherwise I can go straight into my my Shadow Flame. That's usually usually the way I think about it. Don't blindly follow these builds. A lot of these people don't even know what the hell they're doing. So um, sheep follow sheep. So. Yeah, hopefully this kind of clarifies. And the way I spoke about the build path, hopefully that really clarifies. And don't build a rise and focus. I mean, look, if you like it, you like it. But I don't know, for me, it just feels really underwhelming. Next one from Nilo K. I've played over 70 Vex games at the moment. I have a negative win rate, so I have a couple of questions. How do you play Vex when you're ahead, but the rest of your team is behind? Champ feels quite useless. Yep, spot on. I can get some poke and some ults, which may result in one kill, but it isn't enough. Spot on. What I would recommend is watch that Vex versus Lux game where I broke down the importance of creating and facilitating a secondary win condition. Vex isn't a 1v9 carry. You can't carry the game by yourself. You need other people fed on your team. You need to facilitate other even or fed members on your team. Okay? Very, very important. So if you're ahead and your rest of your team is behind, that's your fault. You haven't looked. I'm sure there's a window either through the shark mindset or just through overall understanding volatility of side lanes or looking who can potentially be a win con for you to, rather than using your R to get ahead in lane, using your R somewhere else to get someone else ahead and into the game. Something that you really need to consider moving forward. Next one, champion identity. Do you think Vex should be splitting when ahead or trying to grouping? You do it ideally a combination of both. Catching those side waves and then hovering your team. And if a fight is going to break out right now, you need to be automatically hovering your team straight away, even at the sacrifice of side lane farm. Again, watch those vault reviews that I did at the end of the guide. Those will really clarify that for you. How do you change your play style when you don't have your ultimate up? Yeah, so if when I don't have my ultimate up, I'm generally just catching sideways, or what I'll do is I'll just sit on top of my team, sit on top of my carries if I don't have time to catch a side wave because, yeah... You're, you're right. Most of Vex's damage is tied to her ultimate. It is quite miserable when you don't have that R cooldown up. 
Um, next one from Vex Arian, cool little name there. Um, what are to- what are her toughest matchups and how to play into these tough matchups? So that's why I included the Vex versus Victor VOD. Victor is one of Vex's hardest matchups if the Victor plays well. Um, and it's all about farming. It's all about farming. It's all about matching the wave clear, keeping the wave somewhat neutral state, trading your HP for the wave, probably even taking TP and then TPing back to lane. Like exactly like, um, what's his name again? Something FS. Um, that, that Victor VOD that I reviewed before. That is a really great example of how to play those tough matchups. Focus on your farming. Once you get six, you're going to be able to exert a little bit of pressure, hover in between the waves. That's where DMAT can also come into play. Experiment with DMAT in some of those matchups can be quite nice. Next one from Isaac. What advantages does she offer compared to other mages? The main one, Isaac, is that she can follow up, she can complement aggressive engager into junglers better than any other mage. Like if you see a Rek'Sai on your team, you see um, Jarvan, you see Zed Jungle, you see um, any engage oriented jungler, Elise on your team, you see a Zac, something that's engaging, top laners, you see Camille's, you see these champs on your team, she can complement them and completely change the dynamic of the team composition. Completely. If you see an engage, if you see a bunch of engage, if I see two or three of these champs on one team, like a Leona, plus a Jarvan, plus a Camille, and it doesn't even matter what your mid matchup is at this point. You can pick Vex into anything, anything. It doesn't even matter because no matter what happens, when it gets to mid game and you have your level six, the enemy won't be able to play the game because there's too much multi-threat. As long as you're positioning appropriately, they can't play the game. I would say this is the biggest thing she, she, she offers comparatively to other. Another advantage though is obviously she can neutralize a lot of tough matchups like LeBlanc and a lot of other majors struggle into LeBlanc, especially in 2v2s. Vex can minimize or even win the 1v1 very effectively. So hopefully this um, you know helps you out guys. I'd love to hear how this Vex works for you. Um, a lot of stuff here, a lot of information. Probably not worth watching in one hit. Probably need to space it out. Hope you enjoyed it. Otherwise, if you're interested in coaching, sign up to the Midland Academy waitlist in the description. Otherwise, have a great one, guys.